My hands have slipped through dimensions, touching things that warp the mind and test the metal of the strongest will. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Agadim's Labyrinth Bible. That's right, I get obsessed about these game modes, and I'm going to teach you every little thing that I know. Every single room, every trap room, every cheese. Baby, you're going to be able to beat Apex. I know you stopped playing at Sorcerer because you thought it was too hard and you wouldn't admit it to your friends, but you're going to be able to beat it with this guide. Let's get into it. I'm going to teach you everything I know. Let's go. <laughs> Now, if you'd prefer a written guide to this video, we have it so you can take your own time. It's over on esports.gg, the official sponsor of this video, my 32-page document translated by KZ, Hophasaurus Rex, and Rohan, the wonderful staff. Thank you for supporting Dota 2 content creators. Now, let's get into it. All right, now, first thing is first here. Speed is life. The faster that you move, the less damage that you take. And this is going to be repeated about a thousand times during this, uh, this little Bible here, but I wanted to start with it, okay? You've got to keep moving fast. As the difficulty increases, uh, most things will kill you in like one hit. So some people build health, spell life steal, uh, none of that shit matters. Speed, baby! Speed is life! You've got to keep moving, and if you ever have any questions on what to build, go for speed. Build a windlace. Uh, you, when you're done with Yules, get another windlace. Keep moving, baby! Alright, speaking of which, uh, let's keep moving. Alright, let's start things off with general tips. First tip, the slacks circle. All right, now the slack circle is returning from our guide last year, and it is just as effective this year. If you don't know what it is, it's pretty simple. You simply draw aggro, AKA you attack the enemy mobs, and you get them to try to attack you. This will lead them to following you, they chase you, you run away from them, and then you get more and more enemies to do the same until the entire room is chasing you. At that point, you walk in a pretty big or small circle to make sure that those guys continue to follow you. Now, why do you do this? Okay, this is so that you're never overwhelmed. Now, if all the mobs are following you, it means that nothing is ever going to be in your path and then get a lucky hit on you and insta-kill you or something. Having all the enemies behind you ensures that all the damage that you do against those enemies, uh, typically with AoE magical damage, will hit the maximum amount instead of just doing one at a time. This is pretty goddamn important in pretty much all levels of Agnum's labor. In fact, this is the best strategy to do if you are the last person alive and you have to clutch a room, which is extremely common in Apex and Grand Magus. So, almost every single room can be slack circled, especially if you get the little mobs and do tiny little circles in the room until you separate those little mobs and they die. Then you can move on to the elite mobs uh, and circle them as well. Learn the circle, baby. The Lion King was right. It is the circle of life, and you need to be able to do this. If you can get your teammates to do it, it's great, but just wait for them to die, and then slack circle if you have to. Okay, tip number two, let's talk about magical damage versus physical damage and armor. Now, last year, all the enemies had gigantic health pools. This year, however, they have giant armor pools. Now, what does this mean? Well, items like Satanic or typical right-click damage items, they are a lot worse. Most enemies hardly have any magical resistance, though. So this year, getting heroes that do massive magical damage is clearly the meta, especially what I call fire and forget heroes. These heroes are ones that can put down a AoE magical damage spell, and they don't have to channel it. They can just drop it and keep moving and dodging big attacks. Now, any hero can work. Don't get me wrong, that's the whole fun of the game mode. But when you get to the top two hardest difficulties, you're gonna see that it's a lot more challenging and as difficulty increases, a variance decreases. So you're gonna see a lot of magical fire and forget heroes uh, because those are the most popular and they're the ones that are gonna do the best. All right, general tip number three, don't forget you're walking out the gate items, okay? Uh, after you get some gold in the shard collection uh, thing, eh, we'll talk about that later, you're gonna wanna walk out of that room with at least a boot. Now, my favorite is the tranquil boot, all right? Uh, you can get that, make sure that you heal while you're slack circling, it's great, but don't forget, 
buy a wind lace before you walk into room one. Typically, the first couple rooms are the hardest because you have no tools to deal with the challenges ahead. So don't be afraid to spend your money on tiny little items like wind lace. I, I'll be real, I've never bought wind lace in Dota 2 before this goddamn game mode. Now I'm buying it in my pubs. Shit's a good item, baby. Okay, room choosing. Always go for traps. Look, I know you don't want to. Traps are scary, but listen. Traps are scary because you haven't made it to the trap section of this guide where I will tell you how to do them all, every single one of them. I'll tell you how to cheese it. Don't be afraid of them. Anyway, trap rooms are, are the best, and I mean always the best room you can possibly take. They give you elite shards, money for completing them, bonus money if you do it perfectly, and two chests that can be filled with hearts, money, or items. Uh, the amount that you get from trap rooms are literally run-defining in higher difficulty levels. You always take the trap rooms. Even if it's a question mark, the chance of having a trap room is worth taking the question mark based off of any other room. Always go for trap rooms. Now, after you've determined if your room is a trap room or not, always go for the trap rooms. Uh, you're gonna have to decide if it's a hard or an easy one. Now, later in the guide, I'm gonna go through every single room and I'll tell you which is the harder ones or the easier ones. But your big decision should be, do I want hearts, gold, or items? Now, this choice doesn't really matter on lower difficulties, honestly. You're gonna always have enough money up to about Sorcerer. You'll have plenty of hearts, most likely. So uh, you can make those uh, choices based on how your run's going. But in the end game, in the harder difficulties, you should probably always avoid neutral items for the first couple rooms because level one and level two neutral items are pretty mad. Now, don't get me wrong. You should get at least one of these so that you can get a tome before the first boss, but we'll get to that in a bit. Gold is always great. Always fantastic to have gold. Uh, personally, I like getting the first room if there's a hearts available on Apex or Grand Magus. I like going to that first room and snagging a quick heart because typically you'll have potions to get you through it. But uh, in general, my list is on up to sorcerer, gold priority, then maybe neutral items, especially as you get later in the game and the neutrals get better and better as you go on, and then uh, hearts if you need them. However, I invert this for Grand Magus and Apex. I'll usually get hearts earlier because they're kind of easier rooms, the first couple ones, and then I'll go for gold and then later we'll go for neutrals. But anyway, uh, in the harder difficulties, it doesn't really matter what you get. It's more about choosing the safest room. Anyway, tomes, let's talk about tomes. There's this big debate. Do you use tomes uh, instantly or do you save them till the end because you give them more XP? Now it is true. If you save your tomes till the end of the game and you pop them right before the big final boss, you can get a lot more XP. Uh, I've seen it go all the way up to like level 29 maximum, but I, I have seen usually 27. I'll be real with you guys, getting extra talents, not that big of a deal, especially before the final boss. If you don't have what you need to kill the final boss, uh, those talents don't really mean much. So here's what I personally do. Before the first boss, if I have a tome, I'll typically use it. That will give you level nine and it will allow you to max two of your skills completely. I find that to be pretty impactful. After the first boss, however, uh, I just pop those tomes as soon as I get them. I don't really care about getting an extra talent. Oh my god, 200 more HP! Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. I will say, however, one of the hardest rooms are typically when you're about level five and a half. If you do have tome to get yourself to level six, I really see no harm in doing that. Level six can make sure that you guys don't lose a heart, which is typically much better than saving a tome. All right, time to talk about modifiers. Now, modifiers are not gonna be the bane of your existence until you're about Grand Magus or Apex Mage, but uh, when you get there, it's really gonna decide which rooms you take. Uh, it is very important to scroll over the doors and read the modifiers as you get higher up in difficulties because some modifiers make rooms literally impossible to play, depending on what they are, and some can make them incredibly easy. So let's go through those modifiers and I'll give you my personal opinion. Okay, modifiers to avoid. Surge and Chilling Touch. Now, these are very, very easy modifiers to have if there's just one or two boss mobs in the room and that's all you gotta deal with. But in rooms with a bunch of tiny little mobs, this makes a living nightmare. Small mobs require you to kite them in slack circles to be able to get through rooms. If they can simply surge to you or chilling touch you, uh, slowing you down, you're done for. 
Chilling Touch is my most feared modifier by far. However, in some rooms, Surge can be absolutely nightmarish. You ever play the tree and protector room with Surge? Holy Christ, don't go in there. Now, Last Stand is usually not that big of an issue, but in rooms like Drow Ranger, where the boss can hit you at range, it will absolutely destroy you. I'll usually take a Deadly or a Last Stand room every single time in Apex, because if you get hit in Apex, you're probably dead anyway. But for some horrifying combos like Last Stand or Vampiric, boss mobs literally do not die, which is uh, not fun for anybody. Now, those are the ones I'm most afraid of. What are ones that you should actively look for, uh, potentially to make it easier? Glimmer and Meteoric can be a living hell in some rooms, Ooh. but in other rooms, the constant going in viz or blinking interrupts their giant attacks on big boss mobs, making them do literally nothing. Ooh. Now, this does add a lot of unpredictability, but typically these big boss mobs will be, have to charge up these large attacks. Glimmering or Meteoring can cancel those and then make the room pretty much super nerfed and easy to do. However, be very careful about Meteoric. Some bosses like the Rock guys can Meteor and still do their attack, making it literally impossible. It's so scary. Be careful, guys. Don't forget, you can always buy dust if you're going to go into a scary looking glimmer room and make it a lot easier. The mobs do not attack while they are invisible, so getting some dust allow you to do some massive damage, uh, which can make these rooms super, super simple. Okay, cheesing, abusing, and high ground, my favorite section. In Apex games, it's pretty common for everyone but one person to die. That one person will probably be you since you're watching this guide, and you're gonna need to clutch the room by yourself. Now we talked about slack circles, but there are better ways to go about this for certain heroes. Here's the key, AOE ground targeting spells. Now enemies aggro to you in this game mode in three different ways. Now first you target and attack them. This is a right click or a single target spell where you select them. If you click on an enemy specifically, it will aggro to you and its friends around it will aggro. Thus, if you have something like shrapnel, fire spirits, tombstone, that means you never actually clicked on the enemy to damage them, so they will never aggro to you. This is standard cheesing. You find a place where you're out of the creep's vision, but you can still cast spells on the ground underneath them and they don't chase you. Now, second way that they aggro to you is that they spawn in. When units spawn in, they automatically see you and aggro to you, but you can lose them by going to the high ground. Now, if a mob doesn't have high ground vision after you lose it by going up a set of stairs and there's nothing up there, i.e. there's no other mob up there, typically they'll lose you on that high ground vision. So it's a very good way for you to get that spawn in, run around a few times, and then lose them in the fog and then be able to cheese them as we did in example number one. Now, the third way that they have aggro is that they always have aggro, but they attack the closest available target. Now, this is for room captains, AKA boss mobs. Many of these boss mobs, they never lose sight of you like the alchemist, but if there is something else closer and you are high ground, they're programmed to attack whatever is closest to them that they will succeed in attacking. Now, this works with the Axe Captains, the Alchemist, Snapfire. Uh, this is why Undying is so good. He has two different ways that he can abuse this with the Gloating Totem and the Tombstone. If you put these down next to one of these boss mobs and you're high ground, they will attack these units instead of any players. But you have to be far away from these units and you have to be technically out of vision. All right, with cheesing out of the way, the last tips in the general tips section. Always build for the final boss. Selecting any talent that helps you get to the boss but is not actually viable during the final boss fight is, frankly, a wasted talent. Stuff like uh, Witch Doctor Ward, I mean, that's great for clearing rooms, but you're never standing still when you're fighting the Primal Beast, so investing in damage for your ward or range for your ward without the talent that allows you to put it down and run away means that it's worthless. Why are you spending 90 minutes to make it to the final boss and then lose it? It's worthless. So, let every decision guide you. How does this blessing or elite shard help me kill the final boss? As long as you can answer that question, then go for it. But if you can't answer that question, and the answer is, well, it should make getting there easier, don't pick it up, man. 
Okay, so I lied. There is a point to getting to the final boss and losing, and that is because you get shards. That's right, baby. This is a roguelike, which means that every time that you play, you will technically get stronger. You can spend these shards on permanent buffs. Now, there's a lot of choices here, so let me go ahead and tell you what my favorite buffs are so that you can actively go for those. Now, the first thing you should prioritize is getting those large inner circles. Stuff like the bottle upgrades, the gold, the uh, death damage, and the reroll shards. Those are all great. You should pretty much fill out your entire opening circles. Don't forget the potions, very important. Now, when you're done with the inner circles, this might surprise you, but you should go for bottle upgrades. The bottle does not get canceled when you get hit in the game mode, and it also does percentage-based heal, meaning that this thing is always good. I would say in this inner circle, potions are probably the most important. They help you get through the inner rooms, especially on Apex. Getting the hearts is also extremely good, as well as general discounts. Discounts are pretty broken. Money is great to be saved in this game mode, but what is the best? What is the best upgrade in this entire thing? All right, check this out. The single best upgrade on this entire thing is bottle speed increase. Now I know what you're thinking. Rerolls are fantastic. They let you reduce the randomness of the game mode. They give you some agency in the RNG, but bottle speed is the best one of them all. Here's why. Every room you complete, you get one bottle charge. Every boss room, fills up your bottle completely. Now, again, the bottle is uninterruptible. It does percent-based regen, but in this game mode, speed is life. And I can't tell you how many times I have been hit with a slow or about to get hit with some massive maneuver from a boss, and I needed just a tiny little speed boost to get me out of that range. The broken thing about this is that this speed boost ignores all effects. If you're hit by chilling touch or slowed by a boss mob about to get hit by something massive, your bottle speed instantly purges that slow until it is empty. That's four times, five with the Naga. Real talk, lives cost 1,000 gold. I use the speed boost to save my life nearly every time. So you're basically getting 4,000 gold with every single time you hit bottle because you're not dying. It is a god tier upgrade and should be your number one. All right, now after you're done with the center, after you've gotten some bottle upgrades, you should really be looking for rerolls, all right? Rerolls and shard elite upgrades. Uh, the best thing you can do in roguelikes is reduce the RNG and give yourself some agency. These allow you to find the shards that you're looking for to make your stuff really, really broken. Again, discounts are super high value. All bottles are great. I would really save heroes for last. Uh, get the heroes, you know, if you really, really want to. The worst one on the entire spreadsheet here Minus 15 seconds death time. Actively avoid these because if something kills you, it's most likely a very powerful attack. Why would you want to respawn quicker, potentially in the cycle of that powerful attack and potentially die to it again? I actively avoid these. I would recommend never getting them. I mean, who wants to die to the primal beast split attack three times because you've respawned too goddamn fast? Alrighty, boys, let's talk items. Now, I'm a support main, so that's gonna, you know, influence how I build, but honestly, this mode is about spamming magical nukes, so I think my advice is pretty good for all heroes. Now, boot choice is pretty important. On glass cannon carries, which you probably shouldn't be playing in the first place, phase boots aren't bad. You can go through little tiny mobs, get some armor, get some speed. Now, I love tranquil boots on squishy spellcasters. If you're planning on clutching rooms alone, having tranquils healing you up while you're slack circling is a godsend during those 45 minutes. Now, the king, though, is probably mana boot. Mana boot is great for the early couple of rooms to provide your team for some clutch of mana for some spell cast. And the best part about mana boots is that they can be disassembled over and over and over again into very good items for this game mode. I mean, you're probably going to be building a lot of octarine cores, going to be building a lot of... It's a good item, all right? Just trust me, get it. Now, the one boot you don't want to get is the boots of travel. I know what you're thinking. You've been telling me that speed is life this entire time. These do increase your speed, but they're not very good late game. And the best speed increasing items are probably neutral items, which conflict with your boot choice. Many of these neutral items override your boots. So wasting money on boots and then boots of travel, then selling them, it's awful. 
Furthermore, if you have money for Boots of Travel, that means that you have money for Blink Dagger, which has a lot more utility. So always get that instead. Now, boots aside, what are the other great items? Octarine Core is pretty god tier in this game mode. As spells are king and reducing the spell casting uh, cooldown is fantastic. There's a lot of ways to reduce cooldown in this game mode, but this is the only way to reduce all of your cooldowns, meaning that it is incredibly valuable. Not to mention, more spell range means less dangerous positioning and easier cheesing. Uh, this guy is top tier. Yule Scepter is probably the best item in the game mode. It gives you speed, it gives you mana, but it gets you a get out of jail free card. Most big spells are heavily telegraphed and a Yule's dodges literally everything in the game mode. It is never bad. If you feel like you're not gonna do well, get a Yule's. If you really feel like you're not gonna do well, get a Wind Waker if you're stinking rich. That is most likely the best item in the entire game as not only can you dodge things, you can also get out of the way and go over cliffs. Blink gets an honorable mention here. You can use Blink when small mobs hit you with no cooldown, though it is wonky. Sometimes big mobs or uh, large little creeps can put that thing on cooldown, but most of the time it's not. More importantly, this is a game mode about positioning and speed. An item which allows you to instantly change your positioning is pretty damn good. Not to mention, you can still cheese some trap rooms by blinking with your blink dagger through those trap rooms. It's in very, very good for that itself. All right, last item I'll talk about here is the Vault Bloodstone. Uh, this one's pretty interesting. They kind of nerfed it, kind of buffed it. I don't know. Basically, you should always get this item if you have a hero that does a lot of spell damage because it has incredible spell lifesteal. But now, if you die with this item, it does remove charges. Sometimes, I've, I've seen it do, I, I don't know, this, this item's real messed up right now, but uh, you should definitely get it. Now, once again, when in doubt, you buy speed. Buy a casual wind lace all the time. If you don't have one, buy another when you turn it into Yules. Ghost Scepter and BKB are fantastic for the final boss, but they're relatively worthless for everything before that, so only buy them if you have a lot of money. Now, while we're on the topic of items and shit, let's talk potions. Use potions and bottles every single time you think you're going to die. Yeah, I know, dumb, but listen up. Potions should pretty much always be used before the final boss. Uh, they don't really make that much of an impact, except for maybe the arcane potion if you're a spellcaster, or the dragon potion, but echo slams, tidehunter ravages, these should pretty much all be gone. If using a potion will prevent you from dying, specifically prevent you from dying, use it. I don't care the situation. 1k gold for a heart is not worth whatever potion you have. Tag them and bag them, boys. The amount of unused potions that I see dropped on the boss room floor, it breaks my heart. All right, get rid of that shit. Woo, okay. That was a lot of stuff before we even booted up the game. So with general tips aside, let's go into your first big choice. What hero should you play? Now, all heroes are good. They can all beat the game mode. But as difficulty increases, your variance will decrease. There are some heroes that are just better than others in the game mode, unfortunately. As such, I have ranked these heroes from meme picks to supreme picks. Uh, some of these meme heroes can go into Apex. It's going to be funny if you win, but they're not typically seen in there. Anyway, these are in order from worst to best. Let's go. Witch Doctor. Now, Witch Doctor is great at clearing rooms with casket upgrades. Uh, accelerating damage with Maledict is also great. But I ask you a question. Why accelerate your allies' damage when you could just do damage by yourself? Why not just pick another hero? The reason that Witch Doctor is down here, though, is because most of his abilities are literally broken. A lot of the healing abilities are actually worse for some reason, including uh, reduced mana cost. It actually increases the mana cost for your heal. Uh, most of his kit doesn't even fucking work. This is why he is in last place. Uh, the hero is legitimately broken and uh, has some really messed up heal talents. Speaking of broken heroes, Lena is there. Half of her shit also doesn't work. She only literally nukes, though, and her magical damage is pretty subpar when compared to other nuking heroes. Uh, there's just honestly so many better heroes you can get than her. Her fiery soul is pretty underwhelming, and it, again, doesn't even work. Her legendary shards also hardly ever combo into each other. So short and sweet, uh, she kind of sucks. 
Luna is actually playable. Nothing's broken on her, but her specialty is clearing small mobs. How does this help you beat the primal beast? It doesn't. She's squishy, she wants to right click, but she has to get too close so she can't. Uh, you can build her with max loosened beams and ultimate, but that requires a lot of shard luck. It's also not amazing because the primal beast moves all over the place. So it gets out of that eclipse range quite often. She's the third worst though, because she has some of the most dog shit talents out of everybody. When a glaive bounce kills something, a eclipse spawns with 35% power. Oh boy, I hope my glaive bounces off the primal beast and hits a golem killing it so that fucking nothing happens. Horrible. Slark, uh, no idea what this hero's good at. His ultimate does not regen. He pounces into enemies so that he can die. His Q seems to be the only good thing about this hero and it's not that good. Uh, he has no cheese potential. He has hardly any team fight. He has no stuns. Uh, homie's got leash. A caveat, however, Leash with certain uh, upgrades can actually prevent the final boss from doing like 70% of his attacks. Leashing him while he tries to jump to an ally to ground pound him actually holds him in place, resetting him into uh, just the charge. So surprisingly, Slark is one of the most broken heroes. However, you do have to make it to the primal beast with Slark, which... Best of luck. Dawnbreaker, another great room clearer, but she struggles against pretty much all bosses. Her ult is lackluster. Her hammer throw is whatever. Uh, really, it's all about her Q. But if you're getting that close to a boss to do damage with your Q, you're probably gonna get one shot. She can be pretty fun in lower levels though, which brings her to the meme tier. Magnus, now this guy used to be a god last season, but his charge no longer breaks enemy animations, so honestly, he's not that great. Boosting your ally damage is nice, but that's really all he's good for. Who, honestly, who wants to be an empowering ally dude for 90 minutes? It just doesn't seem fun. Shockwave is a shitty nuke. Uh, there's just me better choices this year. Why would you want to reposition an enemy when you could kill an enemy? Think about it. Don't pick Magnus. All right, Mars, he's not really tanky enough to tank. His spear can do a lot of damage, but honestly, he's just the hard mode character. He's a lot of fun to play on harder difficulties, but you have to get really, really good with positioning and kiting. Uh, he's not the best hero in the world, but uh, he is a lot of fun. So if you feel like having a challenge and getting some super broken stuff, if you get really lucky, slap a Mars, but don't pick him if you want to get serious. Bane. Literally the most fucking worthless hero in an entire game mode. He is so bad unless you get three shards out of 12. There is literally no reason to play this stupid hero if you don't get the mind control shard first. Remake the game, awful, and by the way, Fuck you for constantly joining my games, hoping to get the one shard that allows you to play him, then wasting my time as you keep getting in feeble shit looking for the one shard. Look, I'm not good at math, but the chance of you getting all three shards so you can solo Primal Beast like you saw that one kid do on Reddit two months ago is this many. It ain't good. It's bad. Fuck you, Bane players. Stop. Okay, past the memes, we're up to the in-betweens. These heroes are pretty good all the way up to Grand Magus. Uh, they might struggle in Apex, though. Sapphire, she can be very good with little shredder upgrades and the raisin cookie upgrade, but she's pretty mediocre without those two. Very fun hero, though, and does have a lot of utility in harder difficulties. She is extremely shard dependent, however, and Mortimer's Kisses is, ugh, it's awful. Kanka, this hero is extremely versatile. You can go with torrent builds, you can go with X marks the spot builds, you can go with ultimate builds. Don't ever put points in tiebreaker, it sucks. Uh, but he's great, he can buff the team and he can also deal fantastic damage. He has a massive power spike, by the way, when you get his ship fleet. Uh, torrent is really weird. It has a special property where it's not technically a stun, it's a lift, meaning that it can uh, apply to a lot of different boss mobs. Anyway, it affects enemies in really weird ways. It does nice damage. It's pretty fun. As for the beast, uh, X marks the spot builds, especially ones that apply BKB effect on your allies. That can be some run saving shit. Disruptor, he can be amazing with kinetic field bonuses and that's it. Yeah, he's pretty mad without kinetic field bonuses. I would put him in the meme tier, but honestly, kinetic field bonuses are so goddamn good, he can legit make his entire team
seem invincible by stacking them with the heal. He is still awesome from last year and a ton of fun to play. Now, Lich can be extremely good, but you have to get the right shards for buffing your teammates. I'm talking about his ult bounces to teammates, gives them BKBs and 50 movement speed. I mean, it's pretty amazing. However, if you don't get the right shards, his Q and E are, uh, <laughs> they're fun on Magician, I guess. Ursa, I hear this guy can do massive broken damage with the right shards. I really want to try this hero, but I've never unlocked him, and I'm not giving you more money, Gaben. So uh, I've seen some videos, though. It looks pretty good with the right combos. Never got to try him out. Here, it's nice, though. Sniper can be pretty good DPS, but he's probably the most high skill ceiling hero in the entire game mode. You need to dodge literally everything and your movement speed is absolute dog shit. Now, uh, how much DPS are you going to be putting on while you're constantly juking? Uh, not that much. Honestly, Sniper's nothing special here. Uh, if you're a brain dead sniper picker in normal pubs, you could play in an Agnum's uh, Labyrinth, pretty much the same, but uh, what do I care? He's all right. Wyvern was the superstar last time. This time she's okay. Physical damage is a lot worse because everybody has high armor. So her ult does a lot less now. There's just better cheesers like Phoenix that can get things uh, much, much easier for you. I mean, she's all right. Uh, she's not great though. Omni Knight. Now I know you've seen the Omni Knight solo the last boss with his repel and his blade mail. I know. He is legit the only true tank in the game mode thanks to his one repel shard that blocks five instances of damage. Heals are good, but if you don't get that one shard, he's pretty mediocre. Strangely enough though, his degen doing damage it can completely break the game mode. He's actually one of the best guys against the feared amoeba boss, and he's super good in the ogre room. But uh, he's not the best, but he's certainly not bad. He's a fine pick. Drow Ranger, one of the best DPS right clickers, but again, the right click is pretty bad. She is the best of the best of the not that great. Now she can juke, she can nuke rooms and deal heavy boss damage, but there are some better right clickers for Apex. Uh, Gus can be great though. She'll get you all the way to Grand Magnus. You'll have a great time. SK, now Sandstorm can get fantastic. It is a nearly room filling AOE damage that can do a ton of different things and be buffed a ton of different ways. Costa can be pretty cool too. However, he has a bunch of garbage shards that really hold him back. He can be super, super good, depending on luck. He's naturally tanky, which is nice for survivability and mobility. You're gonna live a lot on SK, but you're not gonna do all that much damage without the perfect shard combinations. Epicenter is absolute dog shit, uh, just like the main game. Okay, Dream Team. These guys can win Apex in the right hands. They're good throughout all the game modes. Uh, these are again from worst to best. Gyrocopter, this game mode is all about dealing magical damage while not standing still. This is Gyro's entire toolkit. He excels at moving and dealing magical damage. He's great at room clearing due to flat cannon, and he's also fantastic at single target damage. Now, he's not the best in this category, but with the right upgrades, he can beast mode any room. Focus on Rocket Barrage and his ult and his missile. Put only like one point in the flak for some AoE room clear. Now, avoid Rocket Ride at all costs. They keep buffing this. They keep trying to make you take Rocket Ride. Don't take it, okay? It's not a meme. Your main goal is to deal as much magical damage as possible by getting broken combos like missiles. Uh, those can separate and then also do cooldown and also do Rocket Barrage. All of his talents work really well together, which makes him a pretty strong pick. One caveat though, a lot of the AOE indicators on this game mode are the same indicators that he has for call down, making it pretty hard to play some bosses <laughs> tinker with a gyrocopter on your team. So uh, there's nothing really you can do about that. Valve, please make them yellow or something instead of red. I'm begging you. Tusk, this is another hero I have personally not unlocked. I've never played with one, but he is all over the place in successful Apex runs. I would imagine this is because of Tag Team, which can grow to cover entire rooms with no cooldown. Every single hero dealing more damage seems like it's real good. It's like Magnus on crack. You don't need to right-click heroes individually. There's no downtime. Seems good. I mean, uh, it doesn't sound the most fun, but uh, I've heard that Snowball is super good as well and can deal a ton of damage. Not gonna pay to find out though. You're not getting more money from me, Gaben. 
Clinks, much like Sniper and Drought, Clinks is one of the only viable right clickers. Now, what makes him a step above is his natural mobility and his abilities to deal damage without having to stand still and right click. Okay, one actually does make you stand still to right click, but you get to choose when to do it and it's super high value. He only has a few goofy spells and those goofy spells usually help you clear rooms so he can do great damage to bosses. Overall, if you're looking for a hero to just right click, but you're not that great with positioning, uh, Clinks is probably your boy. Weaver! Now, you remember how I said that right click is bad this year? Well, it is, unless you have Weaver. Weaver's bugs do massive negative armor, and the fact that all the bosses are now buffed with just armor, which means that if you plan on running a right click lineup, Weaver is a necessity. I would, however, like to really stress that Weaver in the wrong hands can be an absolute run ender. His ability to Sakuchi and swarm all of the enemies in the room at once, aggroing him to their unsuspecting team, absolutely kills runs. I would say that he is one of the highest skill ceiling heroes. You will fuck up the game if you are bad at Weaver. Focus on buffing your buggies and any other negative armor things you can get like Deso and Medallion. Your job is to shoot your babies, lower armor, and never die. Now, Weaver is invisible in Sakuchi, but there are a lot of new mechanics where all the enemies can gain true sight after a while, so you're not going to be able to clutch as easily as you would imagine. He is very, very good if you want the right click. And past that, we come to the Supremes. These guys are in every Apex game. They are the best of the best of the game mode, and these guys are yet again in order. Queen of Pain, she used to be one of the best. She got pretty heavily nerfed, but she still has a lot of really, really good spells. She is a magic damage mobility machine that heals herself and can clear mob rooms better than any other hero. Her weaknesses are pretty few and far between, but she can get really screwed by some of the apex enemy modifiers, such as Root on Kill. Now you can build against that, but it takes time and items, meaning that the earlier levels are gonna be pretty tough. Now, unlike our next hero, the amount of damage that you deal is insane and your teammates will actually like you because you're able to kind of be a pseudo tank while at the same time drawing aggro and dealing massive AOE damage. Focus on scream and blink abilities unless you get the good ones, the daggers spreading around and the scream at the end of blink talents. Uh, don't forget anything that can give you big AOE, health on kill or spell steal, it's all god tier. Viper. Now, I had a lot of debate. Do I put this in the best of the best category? Honestly, I feel like this hero is super slept on. He was my favorite hero last season. I still think he's super good this season. By getting spell lifesteal and bouncing Viper strikes, you can legitimately clutch any room by yourself, constantly healing to full HP while dealing massive magical damage. I would say that he's one of the only other tanks besides Omni Knight because of how much he can inherently heal. Not to mention he has great cheese opportunities with his nether toxin, little puddles, these stinky little puddles. Uh, I think this hero slept on. I like him a lot, and you'll never have a bad time playing with him, I don't think. Void Spirit. Now, this is the dream hero of doing magical damage without ever getting caught. Maxing Dissimilate will allow you to be pretty much off the map for the entirety of your engagements, meaning that literally nothing can hurt you as you zip in and out of doing damage to enemies. Now, Void's biggest strength is this. He can do a lot of damage without ever dying. However, while that's great for you, it's not so great for your allies. Uh, uh, mobs have one less enemy to target, which means that they're always gonna be running at your allies. I mean, he's very good at clearing stuff. He does amazing damage to bosses, but if you're a Void player, prepare to clutch alone a lot because your allies have to deal with you never being there. The reason that he's this high though is because he does consistently well. I don't think there's really any bad build on Void Spirit. All of his shards have a lot of utility. They all work really well together. There's really no luck with this hero. If you play it, you're gonna get good stuff and you're gonna find a build that does a lot of magical damage, a lot of mobility, and provide a lot of utility. So you can really never go wrong with this guy. And finally, Templar Assassin, the only right clicker that made it to the Supreme tier. And for good reason. Her inherent shield allows her to actually stand still and right click things without instantly dying. 
Due to her shield reducing a massive amount of damage, she can tank where other right clickers really can't. Now, it's not as good as Omni Knight's Repel, which completely ignores the damage, but it is an amazing ability allowing her to actually attack things. Not only that, she has a ton of great utility for mob rooms. She naturally deals big AoE, big right clicks, and her traps can be boosted to unbelievably strong levels. Overall, she is without a doubt your first choice for a right clicker in this game mode because really, she has it all. And finally, it is time for the top three. The three best heroes this year. Let's get into it. Number three. Juggernaut. He is my personal favorite. Juggernaut can be extremely squishy and he struggles in the first couple rooms, but when it comes to dealing damage and surviving, he is the best in this game mode at both. Your goal is simple. Max Blade Fury. Blade Fury not only does massive damage, it also makes you magically immune, which is how most big attacks and damage work in this game. Jug is the only dependable hero that can solo every single boss, as if you get Blade Fury to zero cooldown, nothing can really ever hurt you. Not to mention that he has many good Blade Fury shards, which all stack. Getting two Blade Fury shards is basically an insta-win if you are pretty good at kiting. Finally, Juggernaut has several Blade Fury talents, meaning that even if you're super unlucky with your shards, you're still guaranteed to get massive buffs to Blade Fury anyway. As if all that wasn't good enough, his non-Blade Fury shards are really, really good too. He can make you invincible after Omni Slash, he gets Blade Fury mixed with his other abilities as well, and his healing wards are probably the worst upgrades, but those make the early levels really, really easy. In short, he has like two bad shards total. Now, since this is my favorite hero, I'll tell you exactly what to do. You max Blade Fury, you grab all the Blade Fury bonuses, you invest in speed and spell lifesteal, do it right and you'll be spinning and dealing massive magical damage and you can have as much fun as you want boosting all of your bad friends through Apex, soloing the Primal Beast. He is an absolute joy to play and is super good. The second best hero, however, is Phoenix, the Cheese King. Phoenix has the most broken ability in the game mode, Fire Spirit Turret. These things do not aggro mobs. They can get upgraded over and over again, and they have many different shards. The Fire Spirits are never bad. They are broken from room one to the final boss. Giant, AoE, magical, fire and forget damage. You don't need to do anything for these guys. Cheese and damage aside, Phoenix also has great mobility, able to heal your allies and do giant magical damage I, they have an extra life it has an extra life that deals damage literally every aspect of this hero is specifically designed for doing well in this game mode heals magic damage mobility support cheese phoenix literally does everything every single team should have a phoenix in it on apex mage perfect hero for the game mode legitimately if you don't know what hero you should play play phoenix and the best hero of the game mode goes to Undying. It was a very close call between Undying and Phoenix, but Undying has one thing that Phoenix doesn't, literally breaking the game. Now, before we get there, let's talk about why he is so good. Undying as a tank is pretty crap in Apex. He's amazing up to about Sorcerer. You can play him as much of a maxing decay monster, big beefy front boy machine as you want, but in Grand Magus and Apex, he shines as a crowd control damage dealer. He has two of the most broken spells in the game, Gloating Totem and Bury the Living. Getting Totem with reduced soul rift time means that literally every mob will be AoE taunted with 100% uptime. This, of course, does not work on bosses, but surprisingly, it works on many uh, elite mobs like the Alchemist. Not to mention, it also AoE heals allies when it's done. Short and sweet, Totem is pretty much a guarantee that you're gonna make it to the final boss without losing a bunch of lives, which is a massive game changer, but that's his bad skill. Your regular Tombstone does the same thing as the Gloating Totem, but it also deals a ton of damage. There are a ton of upgrades that you can get, several zombie shards you can get as well, making Tombstone amazing as an AoE damage dealer, which also tanks aggro. The longer the Tombstones last, the shorter the duration, the more aggro you take for your allies, and the less damage your entire team takes. No other hero takes aggro and deals damage quite like Undying, meaning that your team has a much easier time throughout the entire game mode. But all of this 
healing your allies, drawing incredible amounts of aggro, dealing heavy damage, pales in comparison to the reason he is number one. He is literally the only hero that can solo the final boss and have it be impossible to lose. By maxing tombstone cooldowns and by getting to bury the living shard after all of your allies die, you can literally just hide in the tombstone, pop out, put another one down, and hide in that one. You can do this for an hour straight and letting those zombies slowly tick away at that primal beast. Bosses do not aggro the tombstone, so you just sit in there like a dumbass doing literally nothing. It is hilarious. It will probably be fixed when this guide comes out, so get in there while it's hot. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about every single room and my suggestions for how to beat it in cheese. I will give you how to beat it cheese for maybe breaking it and get you through every single one. Now these are in order of the one you should avoid first. They will go hardest to easiest. So that should help make your decision. Again, sometimes these don't always work. Uh, if you really need hearts, you might wanna do a hard room just to get hearts before a final boss, yada, yada, yada. We'll go through every single room. Let's get started. All right, one, one, these are the first rooms out of the gate. The hardest one, in my opinion, is Chippy Codifers. This is mostly because it spawns in all of the mobs. If you remember from earlier, that means that all the mobs have instant aggro and you guys can't slowly make your way through the room. Uh, this makes people panic typically. Most sit in the first corner that they walk in and then a few of them die till they finally leave it. The spawn locations also are very wide open and random in this room. They cover the entire thing. So starting off by doing a slack circle is extremely messy because you're always gonna have guys in front of you. Uh, overall, I would say never go into this room with the chance and you do have a chance unless it's something like an elite and you really, really wanna get those shards. Uh, no, choose this one. No real cheese here run for your lives uh watch out for the exclamation points above the pine cones they're gonna mess you up for the cubs second hardest room in this one there's a large ursa he spawns in tiny bears when you start chipping away his health uh, this one is tough mostly depending on the bonuses that the bear gets in higher difficulties stuff like avatar which is a bkb or vampiric ah! those make this guy pretty tough uh but uh, it's pretty easy you just run away from him Hit him, run away. This one's all about sharing aggro. Uh, potions make this one pretty easy. Uh, so when one of your teammates starts getting hit, you trade off, you make sure they don't die, and then you go in one at a time sharing that aggro, hitting those boxes, and taking care of those bears. If you have a Ravage potion, an Echo Slam potion, make sure you use it in this room and uh, do your best. Uh, there is a little bit of cheese in this one. You can actually walk over here as Phoenix, get the bear to follow you over here, and then attack him from here. So, uh, this only works until the first wave of bear spawn, though. It's not very useful, but hey, every little bit counts. All right, Magnum Mine, second easiest one. This one's pretty easy, but it's very tedious. You walk into the room, you clear all the mobs, and then you attack the tower. Now, after the first room, Mobs won't spawn until you attack the second tower. So here's what you do. You clear all the mobs, you send your entire team back to the starting room, and then have the hero with the fastest move speed attack the tower and then run back. This narrow hallway right here, this forces the mobs to go in one at a time, making this fight much more manageable. When you're done with that, you go to the third tower, kill all the mobs, and then do it again. Send everyone back to that first room, hit that third tower, and then that guy's gotta run back to that first tower. Now, most people will waste potions in this room, uh, insta-kills everything. Uh, personally, this room's so easy, it just takes a little patience. Hold on to those potions, man. You're gonna need them. It's very easy, it's just annoying. The brew room, this one is extremely easy if you do the slack circle. Kill the first brew master and then have the hero with the most move speed aggro all the brews and slack circle in the top part of the map. The rest of the team will aggro one or two of these brews and then kill them and then keep repeating. As long as you guys are killing one or two at a time, it never really gets out of hand. Do note though, you always wanna go for the fire panda first. He's the one that really does some damage. Some heroes can stop the split like Magnus charge, but honestly, uh, you shouldn't plan your entire team around room one, am I right? Slack circle absolutely wrecks this room. 
And the easiest is stay frosty. It's uh, actually a lot of fun. Uh, no enemies spawn in this one, so you can slowly make your way through the room at your own pace. Uh, typically, I deal with the mobs that start off, uh, clear up this uphill here, then I'll go to the left. After I get level two, I'll double back and go onto that uphill and then take down those mobs that are downhill of you. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. Most dangerous part about this one is walking in the uphill and then getting hit by the frozen attack. So you want someone with an AOE damage spell or something to kind of aggro those guys on the uphill, get you to chase them down. And this one is a piece of cake. Okay, we're done with 1-1, one, one. let's go on to the next ones. Silent Killer is the hardest one on this level. Much like last year, it is absolutely nightmarish, especially on higher difficulties. Draw yourself this massive damage. The mobs that spawn in here have instant aggro to you. It's really the only room that forces you to spend your money to not lose hearts because you need to buy a dust. Uh, avoid this one at all costs if you can. General tips, everyone buys dust and uses it when she goes invisible. I like to tell my team we're gonna dust her in the order of our player portraits so that two people don't dust at the same time. A uh, cheese? I know there is some kind of cheese where drow can get stuck on a high ground or something. I think they fixed it. I, honestly, don't go in here trying to cheese this room. Just don't go in here at all. Fuck the drow room. Jungle Jam returns. This is the Dazzle Huskar room. This room is all about successful peeling. You want to attack one enemy at a time and then get them to go back into your team and slowly, methodically go through the room. Peel those Dazzles. Make sure they're not with the Huskars. I mean, this room is not technically that hard. It's just long and annoying, so I typically avoid it. Now, this room does get pretty crazy with certain modifiers like Meteoric, where the mobs will instantly aggro to you. If you get hit by Dazzle's Q, make sure you don't get hit by any right clicks or that Q will refresh and kill you. Uh, this one is, again, about trading aggro, peeling one creep at a time, waiting for your big cooldowns. Uh, when you do have to fight the Huskar, it's best for one person to aggro Huskar. Everyone else gets out of the way. Let them get jumped and then save them. Boring, slow, boring! Bug bait. This room can be pretty okay with crowd control heroes, or if you have some nice starting echo slams or tide hunter potions, but uh, this one can shave off some lives and harder difficulties. Entering this room really is about your team composition, and if you want to do it, if you don't have a lot of AoE powerful spells early, I would not go in here. However, on lower difficulties, you should always go in here, though, because you can protect your carry. That's right, this little guy's name is Carry. Anyway, if you protect Carry, they will drop you a little heart. So, pretty easy to do. Carry is never going to make it alive on Apex. If Carry lived on your Apex run, send me a picture, and I'll frame it on my wall. On higher difficulties, definitely don't waste your time trying to save Carrie. Just do the slack circle. You'll be fine. Rest in peace. Beautiful Carrie. Dark Forest. I know this one can be pretty crazy, but honestly, it's pretty easy if he doesn't have good modifiers. He's going to launch himself one of those vine attacks. Don't get hit by that. There's a giant, very slow AoE circle nuke. Don't get hit by that. And then he just got to kill some bears. Hey, honestly, this one's not any really cheese strategies you just kill the goddamn thing and don't get hit now don't go in here if he has surge because he is the most powerful boss in the entire game but uh everything's so telegraphed in this room it's not really that hard okay salty shore this one is the easiest though it is annoying and it can sometimes take some lives there's gonna be a bunch of bird mobs but more importantly there's a bunch of mines now there's a trick to this room after five mines uh, that's when the birds spawn in. So what you're gonna want to do is go all the way left. That should get you up to the high ground, and then you'll be able to fight all the birds that are originally in the room. When everything is dead, then you can send somebody to pop that final bomb, and then you guys can make your stand on that high ground. You want to prioritize the small birds first. These guys can be affected by modifiers like Chilling Touch or Deadly. Leave the big birds for last. Uh, this one, not too hard after you get rid of those small birds and if you're not overwhelmed. If just one person in your party does hit a bomb on the right, you're going to have a really bad time. But it is, you know, the second room, so whatever. Just quit the game. Okay, next series, we have jellies, scarabs, moles, and peels. Jellies, never take this room. I don't care what mysterious treasures it has. I don't care what its effects are. 
don't go in the jelly room. It takes forever. It's fucking annoying. Someone's gonna lose a life. It's bullshit, all right? The only reason you should ever go in a jelly room is because you went in question mark room hoping for traps and it accidentally became jellies. You enter the rooms, jellies spawn, they jump around, they deal massive damage. When you kill them, they leave behind a puddle. Penis. They do big damage to you where they died. Uh, this one's awful. The real trick is that you need to drag these guys back as far as you can into the room, into the beginning of the room that you just walked out of. You want to try to kill them in corners, you want to draw them back in the rooms that you were in. Whatever you do, you don't want to kill them in between your passage from room to room in these little tight corridors. Then everyone's going to die to the jellies. Ah, uh, it's just... Fuck this room, honestly. The real reason this room sucks is because everybody gets bored of slowly pulling the jellies in the corner. Somebody eventually gets bored and kills one, and then all hell breaks loose. The entire room is just filled with jelly puddles. It's a goddamn mess in there. Uh, the final wave spawns a godless amount of mobs to chase you throughout the room. The little visage birds are awful. I mean, I, what do you want me to say for the cheese strat? You want to take 30 minutes slowly pulling uh, mobs back in the corner? No. Here's the cheese strat. Don't fucking go in the jelly room. Morphling room, this could be as scary as it was last year, but this year it does have a lot more room, which means that slack circling the room is pretty easy. You're gonna wanna kill the first wave of Krabbies and then start slack circling immediately with your entire team. Keep moving, take your time, watch out for modifiers in here. Anything like Meteoric or Surge is gonna make you have a really rough time. Chilling touch, for the love of God, don't go in there. But overall, it's just slack circling when the mobs spawn and slowly taking them away. Watch out for the barfs, though. They typically all waveform at the same time and can nuke your entire party if you get lazy. Multiplicity, much like the jelly room, this room requires you to sit around for a long ass time, not having any fun, or you're going to lose. It's pretty simple. There's four Phantom Lancers. You get into melee range of these guys, they will shoot a projectile and spawn more Phantom Lancers. If you don't get into melee range, right click them with a single target spell, uh, they don't, don't really do anything. So obviously, you just want to cheese the fuck out of these guys. Never click on them. Use those ground targeted spells. Is that boring? Slow? Yes. But if you don't do this, the room is very easily a run-ender. Your goal should be the first Lancer, then you go to the one on the left, then you go to the one on the right, and then you take the top one. But you do not want to take that top one from the center of the room. As soon as that top Lancer dies, two more will spawn in the middle and have instant aggro. So if you're standing in the middle, taking that top one, they're gonna spawn right on top of your head, they're gonna spawn more Lancers, and it's gonna be a nightmare. So take this top guy from the left side of the room, get that aggro off you by going uphill, and then slowly take the goddamn Lancers down. General strats and cheese are the same. Cheese these kitties, never get into the melee range, or you're gonna lose some lives. Okay, the Scarabs. Now this room is cake for some lineups, but it is absolute hell for others. Welcome to your first encounter with blade mail and uncontrollable damage. Now Scarabs attack you, but they also make little poop mounds, which create more Scarabs. Those little mounds are your first priority. Two right clicks and they die. If you don't do it, they'll spawn a little Nyx and this battle will get out of control. If you always hit these little mounds, this is a pretty straightforward fight unless you guys have uncontrollable damage, aka uh, something like Gyro's Rocket Barrage. Uh, these guys do spawn blade mails, and those blade mails can be particularly deadly. They do a lot of damage and they also stun you out of nowhere, so uh, be very careful. Gyrocopters, Phoenixes, and other guys that uh, do uncontrollable magical damage, this room can really get you if you're not careful. Send others in for you. Moles! Moles ain't easy! But they're certainly the easiest ones on this level. Uh, this one is pretty straightforward. You're gonna be hitting stuff. Big moles will eventually burrow underground and then whoop, they'll pop out. So keep an eye out for that tunneling animation. Also, that tunneling animation does apply negative debuffs. So if they have chilling touch in this room, that is a true nightmare as they will burrow under you, slow you, and then pop out. You gotta be careful in the mole room. It's pretty easy though. You get as many as you can and then you start slack circling. Uh, you will get level six in this room most likely. So do make sure to use that about halfway before. I always pop a tome if I'm gonna go into the mole room 
room to make sure that I have six at the start of this fight. No real cheese in this room. I will say the best way to beat this room is to quietly whisper moles over and over again. I don't know. The room's monotonous and it always makes me laugh. Moles. All right, next up, you got the caverns, bamboozled, toothy toothums, and melancholy morass, molasses. I don't know what the hell it's called. Okay, hardest one here is the swamp. Now, with sub lineups, aka with healers or blink dagger heroes, this one's actually one of the easiest ones. But as you get higher up in difficulty, you tend to have more DPS than healers, which makes this one pretty hard. Walking in the swamp slows you down, and every single enemy does Venomancer right clicks to you, which is very tough. The Venomancers also do Veno ults, which, while that can't kill you, everything else is doing poison tick damage, so if you get hit by anything else in the room, it will kill you. The trick of the room is these flowers, which, when attacked, will provide a large AoE heal. The room becomes kinda simple. You take out the small mobs, you send the somebody with high move speed, to trigger the Venomancers to ult, they run back before it hits them, and then you clear out the Venos. Any mistakes, you hit a flower and you move on. But the real problem here is the last wave where they spawn. You're usually over here on this high ground and then they spawn on both sides of you. At this point, you need to make a decision and you need to push. I usually push to the right. If you stay up on this high ground, you're gonna get overwhelmed and everyone is going to die. So your best strat is to get somebody to kill these boys, kind of get that spawn in, and then make sure that you all push together, wait for your cooldowns, and get going. Again, the cheese in this room, it's kind of, you just get a, the right hero comp. A lot of healing heroes like Omni Knight and Undying and Juggernauts, uh, they can make this room pretty easy, but if you don't have any healers, get ready for a hell of a fight. Toothy Toothums! Okay, I put this one as the second hardest. It is actually the easiest, but it is the most annoying room in the entire game. All you have to do is hit the life stealer, peel him away from his grim stroke, and then slowly attack him. He rages when he gets six attacks in a row. If you attack him too quickly, he will rage and then kill at least one person in your party. So you can't fill up the no-no bar. What does this mean? Slowly hitting him and then walking and then hitting him. Oh my God, it's so monotonous. You can technically have some fun by dragging him onto the spike plates. That's about as exciting and fun as this room gets. Uh, it's boring and it's fucking tedious. So you have to do it one at a time. Uh, if you have a Winter Wyvern or an Omni Knight or something that can protect you from physical damage, this room gets a little bit faster. But honestly, I don't have the patience for this shit. Uh, neither will one dude in your party who just gets bored halfway through and just starts nuking things and he doesn't fucking care. He just wants it to be over with. Uh, this one really is the second hardest because of how disappointed you get in your teammates because they get bored. Just go die in the swamp, honestly. I'd rather die in the swamp three times than have to trudge through this shit. Bamboozle! The monkeys! This room used to be fully cheesable by Phoenix, but they fixed it, kinda. Now when you AoE ground attack the small monkeys or the medium monkeys, they do come to you, but honestly, this is not a really big issue. Uh, Monkey King is the one who really hurts, so take out all these little monkeys nice and slow until you clear out about half the room. Once the southern half is clear of all the little monkeys, then you want to move a little bit towards the middle of the room trying to find the Monkey King. The Monkey King is the one that's going to kill you. He does make uh, little symbols on the ground, which you can avoid, but honestly, you should have a phoenix in your party, and phoenix can fully cheese the monkey king by finding him in the trees, hitting him with the fire spirits, and then hitting him with sunray stuff. Uh, any ground target AoE will be able to cheese monkey king without him jumping down. I would highly recommend it. In higher difficulties, monkey king can one-shot most heroes on your team. Basic strategy, clear out the bottom half, find the monkey in the tree, kill the monkey, then clear out the small mobs in the top half, find the monkey, and move on. All right, the Underlord room, I would say the easiest room in this level. This is where everyone found out that Phoenix is broken. 
Underlords will hit you with Firestorm. If they do connect, they will have little demons that spawn and they bite your little ankles. I uh, can't do much against the first one. Uh, he's going to hit all of you. You clear the demons. You hit the Underlord. When he gets low, he's going to spawn a gate and run for the portal. Any stun will stop him from going for the portal. But if he makes it through, he will heal up. Honestly, let the bastard go through the portal. When they portal around the map, you can actually hit them with ground targeted AoE spells. They will run over closer to you and they will not return, allowing you to cheese the F out of this room. Just make sure that you're not standing to the edge of the room where they are or they will be able to hit you a firestorm and then you're spawning demons and getting hit for no reason. Anywho, you should be able to cheese this entire room without ever having to go through a portal, but if you do want to go through a portal, make sure that you send one person at a time. One guy goes through, he gets hit by the firestorm. When the firestorm is over, everyone else can come in. Uh, it's not that hard. Slow, steady, easy. Nobody should die. Piece of cake. All right, boss time. Now, we're not going to get into the bosses here. We'll do it after we get through all the rooms, and I will provide you with strategies for each one of them. So we're going to move on to the bonus rooms. Okay, the Pudge Hooking Room. This one is one of my least favorites. You hook the fish as the Pudge. Okay, general tip, always go for the closest fish. It uh, not only reduces the amount of time that your hook is in the air, which means that you get to hook more, but it's also the easiest. Now, the golden fish, of course, are really what you should be aiming for, but not a lot of people know this. The most money you make on this room is by not missing. There is a hidden combo thing that pops up once in a while, and you get more money if you do not miss hooks. And this includes accidentally hooking the mines. It is better to hook a mine than to miss the combo. So surprisingly, the, you will get a lot more money if you just make sure that you never miss a hook. Uh, missing a hook is actually awful because you ruin the combo. It takes uh, most time to get back to you, and it's a piece of garbage. So don't go for those crazy hooks trying to get that golden fish. Just go for the easy hooks, and you'll make a lot more money, I guarantee it. All right, the mango orchard. This one's pretty easy. Everybody goes into their side of the forest and they collect mangoes and throw them at the snap fires. Now, what people get confused here is that they forget to pick up the money in the center. You should separate your team into someone going north, one guy going left, one guy going right, and then uh, you have one guy in the middle that is just there to try to catch money. This is not only good because they get the money, but also if you miss throwing mangoes towards the middle, you'll hit that guy in the middle and then he gets to re-throw those mangoes. The one thing you don't want to do here is hit the ogres with mangoes. That makes them angry for some reason. They get giant, they get fat, and they hit a lot harder and a lot faster. So, Time those mango throws. Get up right in Mortimer's face and shove that shit down that little piece of garbage throat. And finally, my favorite, the penguins. This one is so easy and everyone should know how to ride a goddamn penguin by this point after Silk Breaker and the first Agnum's Labyrinth. Uh, this only has one rule. Stay in your lane! If you leave your lane, you're gonna ruin everything. Let me explain this. When you get on a penguin, there is a very clear lane that you can go down travel down that lane even if there's no gold ahead of you because as your allies pick up gold gold will randomly spawn back into these lanes meaning that you could have gold spawn in front of you as long as you stay in your lane the worst thing you can do is be behind somebody else and go into their lane you get to the end you circle around and then you can go into somebody else's lane the only thing you got to think about in this room is keep up your speed never veer off to go into a giant pile of gold because you have three teammates that can easily do that you got to keep moving you got to go back to the room at the beginning where everyone else passed because that's where all the gold spawns keep moving don't stop avoid the fat walruses love this one Okay, bonuses are done. Let's get back to work. You're going to go through a mind-tingling encounter, the chain gang, hard-boiled, or spook town. Okay, hardest one here is mushrooms. This one's pretty easy if you have a few reliable stuns, but if you don't have reliable stuns, this one is the run ender. There's mushrooms that are sleeping in the room. When you attack them, they will come for you, and these little bastards hit hard, so you really gotta focus them. But once you enter the room, shadow shamans keep spawning over and over again, trying to shackle someone in your party. These do massive damage and can only be stopped with a stun or a yules or something like that. They also 
also might have Avatar or Glimmer, which makes this room even scarier. God forbid if they have Meteor Hammer. So anyway, they're going to constantly spawn. Eventually, you'll find these big mushrooms. You kill them. They spawn the little mushrooms. This is a, a checklist room, if you will. Do you have stuns? Do you have AoE? You'll be fine. Do you not have those things? You're going to die. So do be very careful. Uh, cheese, not a lot of cheese opportunities in here. Make sure that you verbally tell the one guy in your party with a stun never to use it and always be behind other heroes. The shamans will always latch to the hero that is closest to them. So put your tanks in the front, put your stunner in the back and kiss your booty goodbye. Now, the other three levels on this one are actually pretty easy, uh, but I'll put it in order here. Spooktown. Spooktown, it doesn't really give you gold bonuses. The other ones do. Uh, it's the walrus room. We've all faced these stupid goddamn walruses a hundred times by now. You should know the drill. You aggro them. They're gonna yell. They're gonna jump three times. Move out of the way. Now, what makes this room easy is that these walruses are separated by two groups that dance satanically around these houses. You can peel one of these groups at a time, deal with it, peel the next one, deal with it, and then you gotta go for the well. Now, if you get too close to this well, a big mob will spawn that is invincible until you kill the well, making this whole thing pretty tough. But, fun fact, if you don't get close to the well and you hit it with AoE magical damage, uh, it doesn't actually spawn the guy at all. So as long as you never get close, the room gets a lot easier. Anyway, after the well is halfway down, mobs will spawn in. They'll instantly aggro to you. This is where people usually die. Just calm down, dodge the walruses. It ain't a big deal. When you're done with that, you can move into the well and you can kill the well with AoE from afar. Or if you're feeling spicy, you can get close, spawn the big mob, kill the well. If the big mob does spawn, if some idiot gets this too close, it is leashed to the well. So all you need to do is walk away from it and it will be forced to walk back, making cheesing it uh, pretty easy, if not time consuming. Now there is only one note I have here. I swear on Apex, these guys do not double jump forward. I swear. The walruses double jump to the side. You can quote me on this one. I only died in this room on Apex. They changed their behavior. It's really messed up. So anyway, uh, not a hard room though. Just watch out for Apex and watch out for crazy modifiers. Hard boiled. This is the Omni Knight room. Uh, there are eggs in this room. Omni Knights and Dragon Knights will spawn and then they'll try to kill these eggs. Uh, all you have to do is try to aggro them once uh, and they will follow you instead. This room's pretty damn easy. You just don't get close to the Omni Knights when they have the giant circle around them or they will most likely insta kill you with a heal. Massive damage. The fight isn't the hard thing. The hard thing is stopping them from getting the eggs. So make sure that you tell the Phoenix in your party or the fastest character like a Blink or a Void Spirit, hey, make sure that you aggro these guys, get them together and then kill them before they get any eggs. For every egg that survives, you get five bonus gold. It doesn't sound like a lot, but honestly, you're usually about a hundred gold away from a big item purchase before the boss. So this room can really make a difference if you stop those eggs from getting hit. Mobile heroes like Quap or Void Spirit, Phoenix, your guys' main job is to get that aggro, don't let them hit the eggs, and return the Omni Knights to your team. Profitable, no cheese needed, have fun, pick this one every time. Unless, of course, Chain Gang is available. This one is super easy because no mobs spawn on top of you. You know what that means? You can aggro each group of mobs one at a time at your own pace. Take your time and make your way through the room. Now, you can make two mistakes in this room. Number one, which is forgivable, is aggroing too many at a time. The boss mobs in this room are not a big deal. They're going to do some slams. They're going to do a giant AoE razor attack. That's easy. When it starts mixing and matching, when there's two of them, it gets a little crazy. The real unforgivable mistake is hitting the buttons. In this room, there are Slardars. They are trapped behind these walls. If you hit a button, the Slardars come out and help you fight. And by help you fight, I mean miserably die. If you hit a button and you free the Slardars, I will kick you from the party. I will leave. Don't hit the buttons. If you wait and you don't hit the buttons, if you kill every mob, the Slardars will TP out, leaving giant piles of gold. You don't have to do anything. Keep them in their cages. Everybody go collect the gold. This one pays out well. It is very easy. You should take it every time. Don't hit the buttons! All right, time to get hard again. These ones are all pretty tough. Mr. Cleaver, World Beyond the Rim, Twilight Maze, and the Crumbling Colonnade. 
Twilight Maze is definitely the hardest one. It is the dark skeleton room with tusks. It's honestly a fucking nightmare. It's pitch black in there. It's narrow. You can't slack circle because you have to make your way through. Uh, with the wrong effects, this one is a sludging campaign of absolute misery. Here's how it works. You walk in, small skeletons always aggro to you when they see you. You have ghost tusks that shoot AOE fire at you, preventing you from falling back. Then you have big boy tusks that run at you. When these guys die, they explode into a shower of tiny skeletons. This room is actually pretty easy and fun up to about Sorcerer, but after these little skeletons two-shot you, uh, it's really, really bad. Now the tricky part here is you're probably gonna use your spells to kill the big boys, but they spawn the skeletons and you really need your spells to kill these little skellies. So you need to talk to your teammates about who's going to use spells to kill the big guys and who's gonna protect the rest of the team from the showering skeletons below them. Anyway, the general strat of this room is hard as hell. You peel mobs as best as you can backwards, slowly going forwards as you slowly peel them out through the darkness. If you get five big mobs Mobs at a time, you're gonna have a really, really rough run. Uh, go ahead and focus the ghost tusks first as they prevent you from kiting, and uh, it can make it really hard. Honestly, this is a rough room. You should avoid it pretty much every time. You hear me? This is your family. You're in a coma right now. You need to wake up. The crystal forest. This is what I like to call the hubris room. It's pretty standard. Lashrax spawn with the little helpers. They do their Q. It does a lot of damage. There's two small mobs for each Lashrax. I don't even know what those guys do. They're worthless, but... Here is where the hubris happens. There's a tower in the center. If the tower lives, a heart falls out. Now everybody freaks out about this. They all run mid to defend the tower and that's where the Lashraks are strong. They all get their cues together. They all hit their cues at the same time and they team wipe you guys. Don't do this guys. You're not gonna save the tower. Just let it go. Get around the room, separate the Lashrax and try to make your way throughout that room. Now, if all your teammates die, this one is actually pretty easy. Lashrax typically run away when uh, they are done killing something or if they take too much damage uh, and they'll run into the corners of the room. However, they don't stop casting their spells. So if you're really, really desperate and your entire team is dead, you can go watch a TV show, come back in like 10 minutes, they won't have any mana, and then you could just kill them all. So it is guaranteed that you can make it through this room, but it's a room of hubris, man. Just, just pick something else. Fun fact, by the way, if you have your glyph, your tower glyph from the main game uh, bound to a certain button, you can actually hit it and glyph that center tower, which can be pretty clutch. So give it a shot, it's pretty funny. Next up is Mr. Cleaver. Uh, this one used to be the easiest one because there was a great exploit. Don't be tricked, they actually fixed it. So no exploit on this one. Uh, you don't wanna go into this room if you guys don't have some nice, reliable stuns. It is pretty simple though. You're gonna wanna walk around in circles, avoid Mr. Cleaver, and if he stuns somebody, you're gonna need to silence him in some way. You should have some sizable silences here. Yule Scepter works, other things work. Uh, you should be able to get away from him. Take out those little mobs, keep moving, should be fine, especially because Mr. Cleaver tends to get stuck behind the zombie mobs. Do avoid this room. If Mr. Cleaver does get stuff like uh, Surge or Meteoric or God forbid Deadly or Chilling Touch, there are a lot of tiny mobs that are gonna be able to take pieces out of you in this room. So this one can get pretty spooky with modifiers, but if you got stuns, uh, not a big deal. And finally, the world beyond the rim. This one is by far the easiest one. You should take it every time. There's two outworlds in this room with meme hammers. By God, they're not that scary. Uh, what's really scary are the tiny little mobs. You remember these bastards, the, the ancient creeps that got removed? Well, they're back for blood and by God, do they hit you. All right, so anyway, move around the room trying to kill these little mobs. Try to stay in the bottom half of the map so that you don't aggro both the ODs at the same time. When the mobs are all dead, you can attack the OD until the more mobs spawn, then immediately go and deal with these guys. OD's attacks are extremely simple to dodge. He either does a very, very telegraphed straight magical attack that you have more than enough time to get, or he will grab one of your allies and put them in the astral in prison and hit the meme hammer. Much like your pub games in Crusader though, he never lines up the meteor hammer perfectly, so you always have about one second to do something when you're out of that 
little spot and you can spin or run or use your hasted bottle charge and you'll be fine. The one thing you don't want to do is to aggro both of the ODs at the same time and God forbid you don't want to do that while there's still little mob creeps. As long as you take this room in half, kill an OD, you should be good. Now when you start damaging the ODs, they typically run away into a corner. You're going to want to chase that guy, keep him in the corner. This one is super, super easy and you should take it every single time if you can. Except for trap rooms! Go to the trap rooms. Don't forget. Okay, next level, we got My Rock Collection, Roundup Canyon, Red Light, Blue Light, and the Stone Hall Citadel. Now, these are rather competitive as to which one is the hardest one, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it to Roundup Canyon with one caveat. Don't take this room unless you have Undying. All right, so it's pretty simple. There's a giant snap fire and several bat riders. The bat riders, they shoot nades at you, but more terrifyingly, they lasso your party member and drag them away to their deaths. Obviously, you wanna focus on the bat riders first, stun them when they take a party member. In theory, it's not that hard, but things get really chaotic as the bat riders continuously spawn in, and once one or two guys get separated, that's when hearts are gonna get stolen from you like crazy. Stay together as much as you can to try to kill those bats, but focus on Snapfire last. Now, here's the caveat, here's the cheese. For some reason, Snapfire treats Tombstone and the Gloating Totem as a hero unit, she will attack it, but she does no damage. So with Undying, this room is super, super simple. You simply put those two things in front of her, and as long as they are closer to her than any hero, she will attack it without doing any damage, making this room pretty gosh darn easy. So uh, that's about it. Grab Undying, or don't grab this room. Our second hardest one here is probably the Legion Commander room. It's not that bad as long as you take your time. You're going to want to clear out the mobs in the bottom part of the map, then make your way to the middle and summon the Legion. Now, what's tricky, though, is that she fires some arrows at you, which uh, are pretty hard to see, actually, and can take some lives away from you. Uh, it's also pretty scary if she has some good modifiers and she gets one of your teammates into a duel. Always take this room if you have some way to mitigate physical damage, like a Winter Wyvern or an Omni Knight ult or something like that. Makes it super, super easy. So... Take out the mobs in the bottom part of the room, make your way to the middle of the room, which should get the Legion Commander to leave her pedestal and come down and fight you. Retreat back to the bottom, solo that Legion Commander, and you should be okay. Just watch out for modifiers on this one. If she gets something like Last Stand Vampiric, uh, this one... Yeah, run for your life. Now, fun fact, by the way, if you do kill her while she's dueling an ally, they will get dual damage from it. I think it's about 30 damage, and that's actually pretty useful. I mean, it's not insane, but it's actually really fun. Uh, try to force her to die during a duel against an ally for that little bonus. Uh, it's neat. Alrighty, red light, blue light. Look, apparently this one is very easy. Maybe I'm just stupid. Uh, this one scares the hell out of me. Uh, when you enter in, two guys on your team will have a blue aura, two guys on your team will have a red aura. This is how it works. The big death prophets shoot out bullet hell bullets. If you're blue and they are blue, they will not hit you and they will still collide with you. So your red teammates can hide behind you. So if you're blue, block the blue. If you're red, block the red. The number one target though are these green ghosts. They do a ton of damage and they are affected by modifiers. So always focus on the green ghosts when they spawn in first. They will tear you apart. Now, this room is the second easiest, mostly because once you get it, it's not that bad. Caveat here, though, this room becomes very hard if you are the last person alive to clutch because you not only have to deal with the green ghosts, but you'll have to deal with some bullet hell scenarios from the opposite color that you have. Also, this room with Meteoric and Vampiric, holy Christ, it is so deadly. So uh, do watch the modifiers on this one as it can get nuts. But if there's no modifiers that are good, uh, you should take this one all the time. Uh, just focus on those little green guys, okay? Okay, the easiest one on this level by far is my rock collection. This is where the slack circle was born, baby. Last year, you attack the golems, they die, they split into more golems. And when they die, they split into more. 
This room is absolute chaos if you don't do the slack circle, but if you get all the golems to follow behind you and slowly follow you around the room, every time that you attack them with an AoE damage spell, you will attack all of them. They will all die kind of around the same time, and it will make the room extremely easy. If just one person on your team keeps running in the opposite direction of the circle, though, it's going to get pretty nuts. Uh, fun little caveat on these guys, they still do their big rock slide pile attack if they glimmer or if they blink so modifiers can make this one a little chaotic but even with the worst modifiers in the game even with elite on grand magus i will take this one every time slack circle baby piece of cake Okay, next levels are Cardi's Revenge, Palace of the Beast, Gate of the Dead, and the Nether Reaches. Gate of the Dead, holy shit is this one you don't want to go in. Now on Apprentice and Magician, this one's fun as hell, but Sorcerer and Up, this is some nightmare fuel shit. You stand on these buttons, they light up the longer you stand on them. You gotta light up every single button by standing on them. Eventually, when all of them are full, you kill all the remaining mobs. Now the issue is, there is a veritable shitload of mobs that spawn up in here. This wouldn't usually be an issue, but the room forces you to split up onto these different buttons. Also, these tiny spawn, which do AoE attacks, meaning that you can't actually stand on the buttons for that long, meaning, this room sucks ass. All right, so how do you beat this room? Well, it's a little counterintuitive. You want to get a blink hero or a fast hero, someone that can heal themselves and nuke uh, mobs to try to aggro pretty much the entire room away from your team. Split it into parties of two, get your battle buddy, and head for a button. Uh, those two guys will be able to fight together, and then you have either one or two other heroes drawing mob fire until all the buttons are pressed. When all the buttons are pressed, you can go ahead and kill all of the other mobs. It's very, very difficult to do this room if every single person splits up and hits a button, but it's usually okay to do that until everyone gets overwhelmed. So spread out in the beginning, stand on those buttons, and when people start overwhelming, uh, get together, split up, kite those enemies with like a quap or a void spirit, and then everyone else works on those other buttons. Now, I'd like to point something out very scary here. Slack circling, of course, works in this room as it always does, but down here in the bottom right-hand corner, there is an invisible wall on this staircase that kills more people than anything else in this room. So do be careful. I just completely avoid the bottom right staircase entirely in case I will get stuck. So uh, move together on this one. Don't make giant waves and hope that you have AOE clear. Or better yet, the best advice, don't ever go in here. You got other choices. Okay, Nether Reaches. This one is the Pugna. Now this room terrifies people. Honestly, I find it to be one of the easier rooms, but I put it as the second hardest because this room is dependent on if someone on your team is super stupid. I affectionately call this room the random matchmaking murder room, and here's why. Uh, at the center of the room, there's a Pugna. He casts a weird nether blast around the room. By the way, this only damages you if you stand in the glowing part. If you're in the center, it actually doesn't hurt you. Fun little fact. Anyway, it expands. If you walk up to his platform, he's going to hit you a few times, and he'll give you the big suck. Uh, that suck does an ass load of damage, and he also ethrows himself once in a while. So you don't really want to go up there unless you're like a juggernaut who has some uh, magic immunity or something like a dawnbreaker with the right shards. Now this seems kind of worrisome, but here's the thing. If you made it this far, you're probably making it on the back of ranged magical AoE heroes. Uh, which when he goes ethro, he's going to get hit by those guys anyway. So nobody should really be walking up there to right click him because you shouldn't have that many right clicking heroes in your party. But anyway, you can use spells like Tombstone at the bottom edge of his platform and the zombies will still go up. Guys like Phoenix are great against him, etc, etc. You just drop your magical damage up on that platform and you keep moving. The room does spawn baby vipers. This is some lore, by the way. You know, you know, Viper was... Uh, the pet of Pugna, right? It, it's cool. Anyway, uh, you just walk away from these vipers. They're not going to do that much damage. But here's the kicker. This is the killer. When Pugna gets hurt enough, he is going to spawn nether wards. These wards will zap you for every spell that you use. Not only that, they also heal themselves if anyone on the team uses a spell. Meaning that if there's one really stupid person on your team, he will continually refresh these nether wards until it is impossible to kill them. 
So yes, uh, this room is magnificent in making sure that you rage against one particular guy on your team. If no one is stupid though, it's relatively easy. Call out when the wards spawn, nobody uses spells, and when the wards are dead, continue to cast spells onto that pugna. Uh, the faster you kill the pugna, the less uh, things will spawn in the room on this one, so go ahead and kill them as quickly as possible. Don't really worry about the vipers, they hardly do anything unless they have like chilling touch or something crazy like that. Uh, this one's pretty simple as long as you have the right team cop, which you probably should. How do you cheese this room? Use your fucking microphone. Cardi, this one is a little bit stressful, but it's not that hard. There are carts that shoot bombs. You gotta kill the carts first as fast as possible. Now, after you kill a few of them, there's gonna be these big beefy boys, just like last time, who spawn. These guys are pretty fast. What you wanna do is get your fastest character to aggro these guys and do some slack circles while your more mobile damage dealing characters go ahead and attack those carts. Once all the carts are dead, you will get another group that spawns in a second big boy. Your best bet is to separate these big boys and take them one at a time with one guy kiting uh, one of these big boys on like the bottom side of the map. Now these guys are particularly deadly because they have many big attacks. For one, they have blade mail, so your uncontrollable magical damage is going to rip up some of your heroes. And they also have this AoE grabby sunray attack. Uh, that thing kills that. I've never seen anything survive that, so don't go anywhere near that shit. Keep running, hit them when they get behind you, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty difficult room, but honestly, it's the second easiest in this one. All right, easiest one for this floor is definitely the Palace of the Beast. Is that the Year Beast, bro? He's back. Uh, the Year Beast can hardly hit anything. If it gets an AoE range of you, it just does this pathetic little hop. I don't... What kind of attack is this? I don't know. Anyway, the only thing that really is going to kill you are these rolling Earth Spirit guys. Uh, it's pretty simple. You get them to start the roll up, and then you just kind of walk out of the way. Uh, typically, what kills people is one guy dodging these Earth Spirits, and then they land on a their allies and insta-kill them. They do a lot of damage if they do connect. So this room's relatively easy. You clear out the roly boys, then you walk around these poor pathetic ear beasts until they're all dead. There's shrines on the top and the bottom of the room. Make sure that you walk up to that top shrine first because there is a ear beast group up there that you want to kill. Only summon one group of ear beasts at the time. Go to that top shrine, open it up, get the ear beast, kill him and his boulder buddies, and then make your way down at the bottom. Uh, no one should die in this room. I, I don't know how you die in this room. If anyone dies at this room, point at them and laugh. And laugh a lot. Okay, bosses again. Yet again, we will talk about all the bosses at the end of this section, so we're gonna skip that, and we're gonna go straight into the next bonus rooms. Hoodwinked! Throw the boomerang! I hate this one. I don't know how it works. Sometimes there's like two rats. Sometimes it's an endless wall of rats. Like, uh, it's separating North and South Korea. I, I don't know how this shit works. Throw the boomerang. Hit it. Uh, suggestions, don't throw the boomerang on someone else's side because it's annoying. I'm throwing on this side. Stick to your sides. Throw the boomerang. I don't know, man. Ogres, now we're talking. You sit at the base of the stairs with your team and you try to use your club spell on top of your ally. Use your jump after your club and there's always one little second while those are both on cooldowns where you can wiggle around in a little circle and pick up some gold. If you do this one right, nobody should really move that much, but you're all providing gold because you're all hitting the chickens underneath each other. Very fun bonus, by the way. If you ever get a cloak of flames, no matter what, what you are doing, save that in your backpack in case you get into this room. If you get in this room with a cloak of flames, it will attack all those little pigeon birdie chicken boys, and you can make like 18,000 gold in this room. Also, Omni Knight can get the degen aura attack thing that also works in this room, and it gets you some massive gold. If you have these, just walk around the entire time. Don't even try to hit anything. Just literally just walk. The gold flows like wine. Ah, I love this room so much, and that's what makes the hoodwink room so fuck- I hate that goddamn room. Give me the ogre. Radiance also works in this room. However, if your teammate bought a Radiance in this game mode, specifically just in case they get this room, I'd recommend not playing with that guy. All right, bonus rooms are done. It's time to move to the next difficulty, and typically... These will be epic red rooms. Sometimes one of them will be an epic room. Sometimes both of them will be an epic elite room. 
You really got to look at the effects and choose wisely on this one. Uh, if you see an epic question mark, guess what? It actually has a really good chance of being a trap room. Uh, I find that the epic question mark on this one is almost always a trap room, so you should probably try to go for that one. All right, hardest one in here is Al the Chemist. Now, Al the Chemist is not that hard with some lineups, but here's the thing. It's all about your teammates getting hit by stuff. There are two alchemists that spawn and run at you with an unstable concoction, which can stun, and if it does stun, it hits acid spray. Now, what makes this room hard is that usually it might have some good modifiers from elite rooms. As we said, it has a very high chance of being elite, but more importantly, if any of your allies make any issues, any mistakes, you can get AoE stunned and you can get hit with that acid spray as well, making it much, much harder. Uh, the effects are also extremely powerful on this one. If they get surge, if they get deadly, if they get vampiric or drunk, uh, it's pretty nuts. So I typically always avoid the alchemists because there's no really good way to stun them. However, if you trust your allies, it's not the worst room in the world. By now, you guys should probably have Yule Scepters. You should have ways to break and disjoint that charged up concoction. And if you keep dodging those, it ain't that bad. Also, pretty cool note, these guys do aggro to the low ground with things like Gloating Totem and Tombstone. So if you do have a Undying or a Clinks where you can hit the skeletons, as long as you put those things down in front of the Elk and everyone else is on the high ground, they will aggro actually aggro to those things. Honestly, the slack sh circle should make this fight pretty easy, but it's one where uh, one mistake from anyone on your team and you're all gonna pay for it, which I don't really like. Now, Mars. Uh, most people are very afraid of the Mars room. Honestly, I don't think it's a big deal after you learn how to do it. The number one key is to kill the little guys and get that Mars alone. Mars has very telegraphed attacks. His spear is pretty easy to dodge. And by again, everyone should have a Yules, but this time, even if your teammates mess up and they get pinned, the whole team doesn't die. One guy gets pinned, who cares? Anyway, get the fastest guy to get the Mars and try to kite in some slack circles around part of the room while your allies clean up the mobs that spawn in. After the mobs are done spawning in, it is just four people running away from one guy. That's what makes him so much easier than the alchemists. Instead of trying to coordinate running away from two guys, you're running away from one guy which makes it inherently easier. Now, Mars can be pretty scary with Meteoric or other things because he can pop on top of you, but honestly, he's so slow and his attacks are so telegraphed that uh, as long as you have a Yule Scepter or a Blink Dagger or something, uh, this one should be much easier than Elks. Uh, honestly, though, if you see a Mars in a mystery room, I'd probably still go for the mystery room because there's a good chance it could be traps. Now, while Mars or Alchemist, which one is harder? That one might be up for debate. I will say this, the Frozen Ravine is by far the easiest one. You would think these big monsters that probably one-shot you would not be the room of choice here, but in comparison to those other two, it always is. Why do we pick it? The same two reasons as always. Number one, non-spawning mobs, which means that they don't auto-aggro, which means that you can take this room at your own pace and go as slow as you want. And number two, bonus gold. Oh yeah. This room's pretty simple. There's gonna be little sheep, you kill them, and then there are the big boys. The big boys do a sweeping cane hit that can easily insta-kill you on higher levels, but it is extremely telegraphed. You either walk towards the monster, you walk away from the monster, you yules when it's about to hit you. Uh, it's pretty easy. Now, if you get into melee range of these boys, they do this jumping dance attack, which is basically just a death dance. They just literally wanna die. They don't do anything, so, uh, you go ahead and walk towards them, get them to do the please kill me attack, and then walk away and kill them. Uh, now, this room's a piece of cake as long as you do one big mob at a time. It, it, this one's a killer, though, if you get two, or God forbid, more than two, as it's a lot harder to dodge those big attacks. Slow down, make your way through the room, kill these guys, and then when there's only a little bit left on the high ground at the end, release all the penguins. These penguins give you gold if they survive till the end. You do need to pop these penguins out before you kill all the mobs, so make sure that you leave this last group alive. Fun fact though, you can get these penguins and walk them to the igloo and they will drop their gold so you don't have to worry about it. 
So clear all the mobs without hitting any buttons, release almost all the penguins, bring them to the igloo, get your money, and then free that last penguin before you kill the boss up there. Uh, this one is fantastic. It's not that complicated. You can go at your own pace. You get free money. Take it every time unless there's a trap room. Next up, Bomb Squad, Demonic Woods, Thunder Mountain, and the Frigid Pinnacle. Okay, the worst one here, I would say, is the CEM room. Now, I know you're saying it's the Demonic Woods, but hear me out here. You walk in, there's strong wolf mobs, and then there are vengeful spirits. Eventually, Big Bad CM shows up, she freezes you, she ults. That might not seem like a big deal, but what is a big deal is that these venges do massive damage, they stun, more importantly, they can swap you into the ult. Now, if you don't have a Yule Scepter, or any way to break out of that attack, it's basically unavoidable. Considering that most heroes in this game by this time are glass cannons, it's pretty devastating to have this happen to you. Somebody pretty much always dies in this room. Now, when CM loses too much HP, she runs to the south of the map and she won't attack you until you get too close. This gives you an opportunity to kill all the other mobs that are still around and then make your way to the south after you have killed everything. It gives you some nice breathing room to clear out the newly spawned wolves, do all that, so it's a little bit easier, but uh, honestly, this one is all about your items. If you guys don't have ways to get out of the stun, I would avoid it. If you do, eh, it's relatively simple. Which brings me to the Night Stalker room. Now, many people say this is the worst room in the entire game. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't go in here willingly, but I will go in here instead of the CM room because this room is kind of a damage check. You should have enough damage to nuke those Night Stalkers that spawn in. You should have enough damage to get rid of the big Night Stalker. Maybe you don't have a lot of spell piercing things for the Banes. But uh, anyway, I purposely go in the room to see how much damage we're dealing. And if it's not a lot, if we struggle, it's time to buy some more damage items, maybe get a veil or something and beef up that damage. Anywho, bunch of little Night Stalkers spawn. These Banes spawn, they will Fiends grip one of your allies and they do have a Lincoln Sphere. So you're gonna need two interrupts for these guys. But you guys should have those by now. There should be some kind of Yules or some sort of stun that should be able to break those guys up. As soon as you kill a few of these little guys, big boy Night Stalker will spawn in. You're going to want to fall back, do your normal stuff of getting one guy to get his attention until he gets low, and then having another guy go in. Uh, again, this room is all about modifiers. Some modifiers, like, uh, oh my god, Avatar on this one. Jesus Christ, don't go in here with Avatar. But at any rate, this one is pretty easy, only because big boy Night Stalker, while he is scary is affected by normal mob stuff. For example, he cannot go through kinetic field. He attacks the gloating totem in Tombstone. He loses you if you are uphill from him and he doesn't have his flying vision. I mean, uh, he looks like a boss mob, but technically the Night Stalker is affected by a lot of things that affect smaller mobs. So this one is easy to be cheesied if you have the right lineup. Bomb Squad, I think this one's the easiest one. And now hear me out. Uh, a lot of people get scared of this room because they get pulled in by the pudge and hitting a bunch of bombs. Don't be afraid of this room. All you have to do is run at the pudges. As soon as the pudges spawn, you want to get as close to them as humanly possible. You don't want the pudges to hook you from across the room into Techie's Mines. You want them to hook you at point blank range and then be forced to do these horrible right click attacks that do no damage. As long as you run and get in the faces of the pudges, this room's typically a piece of cake. The scariest part of the room is after about the midway point and there's some pudges that are in the corner of the room as long as you get hooked by them close they're not going to drag you through techies bombs and you will be okay if you do happen to get hit, hooked by a pudge uh, don't forget you can always yules or do some other thing to escape any kind of horrifying blast after you take out all the pudges then you can make your way killing the techies uh, this doesn't mean that you can't kill a techies if he accidentally walks towards you into a corner go ahead but i'm just saying save techies for last the pudges are really the only thing that are going to get you into trouble and as long as you run into their face and make them right click you instead of throwing hooks uh, this one is super simple now, by far the easiest one, the one you should take every single time, is Thunder Mountain. These Omni Knight statues have very slow attacks, they're very telegraphed, and by now you should have so much health, you should hit by a truck. Uh, there's also no spawning mobs. You guys know my rule, if there's no spawning mobs, that means that you get to choose 
how quick you go through the room, you get to drag the aggro, and the power is at your own pace. The only tricky thing here is this Nimbus that spawns and does massive damage. Uh, you guys should have some kind of escape mechanism by now, like a Blink or a Yules, or even a Weaver Sakuchi dodges it, even if it's on top of you. It is very telegraphed. You just have to pay attention. I find most deaths in this room happen in the narrow corridor as you go towards the first big Omni Knight. You accidentally click on the uphill or the downhill and then your hero bugs out. So never fight anything in this narrow corridor. Always drag them back or if you're feeling like a psychopath, drag them forward into the 10 enemies that await you. Uh, not to say no one's ever going to die in here. Some people might get picked off by a Nimbus, but compared to the other ones, this one is very controllable. You can go at your own pace and I'd pick it every time. Okay, last room selection, boys. You've got the Forsaken Pit, the Battle Squawks, Smashy Bashy, and Push and Pull. Hardest on this level, Battle Squawks. Don't go into Battle Squawks. There are two options. No matter what option two is, it is better than Battle Squawks. Do not go into Battle Squawks. Here is why. Battle Squawks is the Phoenix Room. It has some dopey ass Ember Spirits that do something, I don't know, but they instantly die, who cares? But what it has is Phoenix. When Phoenix gets low HP, they grab someone in range and they put them into an egg. You must hit the egg! And if you destroy it, your ally comes out. If you don't destroy it, your ally dies and the Phoenix gets full health. Now this room is horrific for many reasons. First, Multiple phoenixes will aggro to you when you enter the room, so that's already issue number one. More importantly, any decent team comp this year has, like, at most, one right clicker. Again, the key this year is magical damage and burst damage and AoE damage, negative armor. High attack speed means literally nothing in the entire game mode. It's awful, except for in this one single room. Just battle squawks. If you have three high attack speed heroes in your party, you're never gonna make it to fucking battle squawks. You lost a tinker 30 minutes ago. So yeah, you got one or two right clickers. Well, guess what? Maybe one of them eventually gets put in the egg and then you're screwed. Also, if one person dies in this room without any hearts, one person, it's over. Okay, it's not over, but it's much harder. Now, if two people die, it's actually over. Okay, it's not over, but it's just not worth it. Look, I know what you're thinking. The birds are predictable. When they get ha a little bit more than you know, a third of their life, then they go and they do their dive and they come back in the egg. So you can just dodge this with a Yules or whatever. <laughs> yeah, except they don't. What makes this room such a nightmare is that randomly it bugs out and the birds unpredictably just egg. Sometimes they egg during the dive because it messes up. If there's any modifiers that move them in any way, they just, they turn invisible and then they egg. It's a living nightmare. It is a room that you can only beat by having a shitty team composition. Don't do it, guys. Have I solo clutched this room? Yes. Do I recommend it? No. Don't go into battle squawks. Forsaken Pit, the axe room. Nah, this one's not that hard, but uh, usually somebody's gonna die in here. There are diaper men, they do nothing. There are centaurs, these are uh, particularly deadly. If you get into melee range, they stomp you into a massive damage attack, but that's nothing like the big old axes. The axes in this room are hyper dangerous. He will call you if he catches you, he does insane damage, and he will insta-kill anybody that gets close with a low health threshold. Here's the thing though, you should be pretty fast by now. You're very close to the Primal Beast. So if Axe can catch you, the Primal Beast can definitely clap your ass. So uh, you have some issues that you need to solve. Secondly, uh, this one is not too bad as long as somebody takes that big Axe, does the Slack Circle, and everyone else kills the Centaurs. What really gets people killed in this room are Centaurs stunning you, which allows Axe to follow up. So make sure you take out those little mobs, make your way to the Axe, and then it's a piece of cake. There is some cheese on this room. Uh, this axe does behave like the alchemists when he spawns on the low ground. If you have the gloating totem or a tombstone and no one else is visible, uh, he will attack that first, allowing you to easily cheese your way through this room. Anyway.
anyway, uh, this is a nice speed check before the primal beast. So if anybody dies in this room, tell them to get a goddamn speed item or they'll be dying quite quickly in the final boss. Smashy Bashy, speaking of speed tests, I like this one. There are two Slardars. One is Bashy. He's the small little guy. He's fast. He builds stun for every time that he hits you. And the other one is Smashy, who brings down the atomic bomb upon anyone who manages to get caught by him. Now, surprisingly, this room is literally completely countered by the Slack Circle. There are no surprises here. Some crabos spawn, they're no big thing. I mean, unless they have chilling touch or something. One guy aggro smashy, everyone else aggro's bashy, and you guys slowly, slowly kill them. Now you do want to kill bashy first. If uh, you kill Smashy first, Bashy gets big and angry, and he he uh, he saw his friend die, and he wants revenge. So do make sure you get the little guy uh, first. And now after little guy dies, Smashy will start to right click instead of just casting corrosive haze and smashing. He does a lot of damage. So don't uh, don't don't make fun of Smashy after Bashy dies. He can like one shot people on your team if he gets too close. Anyway. Do the goddamn slack circle. If you don't know it by now, you probably haven't made it this far. And uh, room's easy. Finally, the easiest room on this levels. One of the easiest rooms in the entire run. I don't even know what the hell's wrong with this room. Is push pull. Uh, it sounds scary. There's going to be Magnuses that uh, grab you and drag you into these black holes that generate on uh, the left, right, top, and bottom of the map. Here's the thing, though. If you just stand in the bottom left or right hand corners, they have to walk so far to be able to do anything to you, they'll never make it alive. They have hardly any health, hardly any armor. I mean, these guys melt. And as long as you stand in the corner of the bottom left or the bottom right, they will probably never reach you. Let's say they do reach you, you still have about a second, a half a second or so to Yule Scepter or something before the black hole activates. So. Even the worst case scenario in this room is not a big deal. The only reason people really die is after the big Magnus spawns. He does, you know, his uh, triple shockwave attack. Uh, this is pretty easy to dodge as well. Just uh, while you're in that corner, don't all get hit by the shockwave on the outro in the intro. And uh, this one should be absolutely no threat at all. I don't know why this room is so easy. It's like one of the easiest rooms in the entire mode. Pick it every time. You guys should be just fine. And there you go, friends. That's every single room choice ranked from harder to easier. But now it's time to teach you guys about the bosses. Now, the bosses here, you don't have a choice. You're going to be spawned in with some bosses, and that's very sad because some of the bosses are much harder than the others. But let's go through every single one of them. I'll tell you how to beat them, what they do, what to walk out for, and uh, your best strats. Here we go. All right, now the first round of bosses are actually what I think are the hardest ones, mainly because you don't have the tools necessary to make sure that you can live. Uh, if you can afford a Yule Scepter before the first boss, you should probably do it, but you most likely won't be able to unless you were just building that as your first item, which is kind of inefficient. Uh, however, before you go into the first boss, you should probably buy yourself a Windlace if you don't have one. And if you have enough money and you have zero hearts, you should probably buy a heart. Now again, the first boss is usually the hardest, so if you have a tome, pop it before the first boss. If you have any money, uh, use it before you go in the first boss. Buy a life before the first boss. This is where you're probably gonna die. Now let's go ahead and switch it up. I'm gonna start with the easiest bosses and go to the hardest one. Not that you have any choice here. Alright, Rizrik. He is, in my opinion, the easiest level one boss. You've fought him before, so that already means that you're more experienced in fighting with him, and it is going to be a little bit easier. He's also the only boss that you can interrupt in the game mode. When he's doing his big AoE saw attack, it is possible to stun him or silence him, forcing him to stop. Now, he will start this up again, and sometimes this can backfire because he'll chains out of this and then do his uh, attack, but it also gives your team a big breathing room to know, okay, big attack is coming. Let's get ready for it. Let's back away. What makes this guy really easy, though, is that he spawns these treants, which die pretty quick, make him susceptible to Echo Slam potions and to Winter Wyvern ults. But more importantly, these guys typically drop uh, healing potions and stuff like that. So he he's feeding you heals as he's trying to kill you. Now, sometimes I face Rizrik, and he can be super deadly because he just focuses one dude on your team and launches everything at that guy. I swear this is some kind of bug in the programming where a mysterious ghost in the shell decides he's going to increase his difficulty by eight. 
Uh, you know what, though? I've seen people yules during this, and somehow it breaks up this weird pattern. So do take advantage of that. Try to stun him when he's doing his big ultimate attack. Uh, farm those little guys. He's honestly the easiest one, and he, everything in here is pretty easy to dodge, unless he really, really wants you. All right, now there is a cheese for the timber saw boss. Uh, it's kind of not very effective unless you have a bunch of ranged AOE spellcasting heroes, which you probably should. What you want to do is get that timber saw with one party member, drag him back to the original starting location, and then everybody hides in that hallway. He actually can't get down in that hallway, but none of his attacks can really reach you easily. Now, if you're not paying attention, you might uh, get hit by these attacks and uh, everybody will laugh at you. Is this cheese that effective? Kinda? I mean, it takes a really, really long time, but you shouldn't die, so maybe worth it on Apex? Honestly, Timbersaw is not that hard. Uh, just man up and go in, but it, it, you ought to be a real, a real baby. You could go over there, sure. All right, the second easiest boss here is Willow. Now, I know you might be thinking, Willow's pretty tough. Yeah, Willow is really tough if your team doesn't have a lot of damage. Uh, the thing about Willow is that it's the only boss that actually gets easier halfway down its health pool. Now, the first part of this fight is the hardest one. She goes into the Shadow Realm, and then she will launch a very powerful attack when she exits the Shadow Realm. Not a lot of people know about this attack, not a lot of people dodge this attack, and it is the one thing that kills the most people in this fight. So every time you see her go in the Shadow Realm, say, everyone, a powerful attack will be launched! I do it every time, and it, it, it really does cut down on the amount of lives lost in this room. Now, after she's done with that, she'll put a cursed crown over her head, try to get close to you and stun you. If she does stun you, she will nightmare you into the weeds there. Uh, that's really easy to dodge. No one should really be dying from this unless they make a pretty sizable error. Again, after you get her to half health, she'll do this horrifically stupid AOE magical fairy thing. All you have to do is walk to the other side of the room, slowly. It even gives you time to get to the other side of the room, which means that a lot of your AOE magical damage will be able to affect her while she is doing this massive channeling spell. So this is the only boss that gets easier the less health that she has. Uh, it is gonna struggle though if you lack in damage. If you don't have enough damage and you don't get her to half health before people start losing lives, uh, she could be a real team killer. But good news, you wouldn't have made it far anyway if you don't have that much magical damage. So she's kind of kind. She lets you restart your run because you weren't gonna make it anyway, dumbass. Earthshaker, now there is a little cheese you can do here. You can walk on the edge of the map and you can pop a few of these rock piles before the fight starts. Honestly, I don't really see this making much of a difference, but it, it's something, you know, rally up the team or whatever. Now, ES is the second hardest boss because this is the only one that punishes you for not killing him fast enough. He acts like a regular Earthshaker. He's gonna throw some stuns. He's gonna throw some fissures. But the real killer is this AOE attack. It spawns around your hero and it won't ever hit you as long as you continue to move straight. However, it spawns around all of your allies. And if your allies are close to you, which people usually group up when they're scared, they will hit each other doing massive damage and particularly one-shotting you. Now, unlike Willow, there's a lot of opportunities to hit Earthshaker. However, these opportunities usually spawn in tiny mobs, and the harder the difficulty gets, the harder these mobs hit, meaning that it's not actually that easy to go and attack him. The worst part about this boss, however, is that the longer it takes to kill him, the harder it gets. If one guy has zero hearts going into this boss and instantly dies, you're probably not going to make it. This is because of his AOE ground attack. The circles grow every single time that he casts it. Eventually, these circles get so large and spawn so many things that it is just impossible to ever have an opportunity to hit him. So this is a boss that you have to hit fast as four. If one guy dies, if two guys die, it's very, very difficult to get to this guy without, say, a Phoenix or a Juggernaut who can ignore that magical damage and still do a lot of damage to him. So uh, that is why he is the second hardest, and it's all about your teammates. Uh, never trust your teammates. And finally, what I personally believe to be the hardest boss in the entire game mode, even harder than the amoeba, even harder than the final goddamn boss, the primal beast, it is Winter Wyvern. 
Now, Winter Wyvern has a very easy attack pattern. She flies overhead doing some carpet bombing thing. You just have to look at your mini map to see where she's going to go and then not be there. She lands, shoots some massive AoE nuke at you. She spawns mobs to chase you. She continues to do this until she gets to a certain amount of health. This is honestly all fine and dandy. You dodge the big ass bullet. You dodge the mobs. If someone is about to have a Winter's Curse, whatever, get away from them. It's cool. By the way, fun fact, when she shoots those giant nukes at you, she will always hit the person that is furthest away from her. So go ahead and send somebody down by the stairs, have them announce what they're doing, and then everyone not be in that direction. She might look at you, but she'll go ahead and do a 360 no-scope on that on dying if you're sitting over there by those stairs. So just uh, be wary of what direction she will have to shoot, and that makes it a little trivial on the orb shooting part. But the good stuff is yet to come. She lands in the middle of the map. She does this Winter's thing and uh, whatever, but she does this one attack. She spawns a Ice Vortex under you, which slows you, damages you, and there is no counterplay to this. These literally spawn under you and slow you. They, you can't dodge them. If you get hit by them, you're going to get slowed and damaged and then die. Uh, the only way to dodge it is with a BKB or a Blink. It's so early in the run, you don't have any defenses against this ability. There is literally no way to, to get rid of it. Not only that, but she is the only boss in the entire game where it is actually impossible to solo her. If you are the last person alive, she will guaranteed hit you with the Winter's Curse unless you have a Juggernaut spin or you can blink your Yules before it hits you and then you can't do anything. There is no counterplay to being the last person alive on this boss. You cannot solo this boss. You can solo Primal Beast, but you can't solo Wyvern. And that is why she is the hardest boss. Honestly, I have no strategy for this one. You, you hit her as much as you can, and then when she gets to that stage where she's literally spawning unavoidable slows underneath your feet, you fucking die. You try to kill her as fast as you can, or you die. There's nothing you can do. This boss is god-awful. Someone nerf it. All right, boss is round two, Storeg. Now, lots of people have trouble with this big boy. I find this one to be the easiest. Uh, first off, his attacks are pretty well telegraphed, and uh, we all have a lot of experience fighting him from last year. Check it out. When he picks up a giant rock, okay, try to dodge it. Now, I know that seems easy, but uh, for real, I see the rock throw kill more people in this room than anything else for some reason. Overall, the easiest way to kill him is to do some classic Dark Souls 1 shit. Stand behind his booty and click him in between the legs. All of his attacks are highly telegraphed, but the key to this room is speed. When he's trying to walk into you or grab you, he's very slow. Use this to open up and deal the most damage. You can even run circles around him and kind of mess him up if you have enough speed boosts in this room. So it's pretty good, especially on Juggernaut. This room does act as a base speed movement check. Uh, if you are slow, if you built no movement items, you are in some serious trouble in the story of room. The other big movie does is this rock pound avalanche thing. These are pretty easy to dodge as long as you run far enough away from them as possible. If you get too close to them, if you're staying in that area trying to deal damage, it's going to be pretty impossible to dodge these things. So just run away and go and deal damage later. Final note. Screaming Storega really helps everybody in the fight. Potentially continue to do this the entire time. Really gets everybody's focus, and I would highly, highly suggest it. All right, now, next up is the Arc Warden. I know what you're thinking. Arc Warden is the second easiest boss on this level. Well, yeah, he is. He has a few tricks that make him a little bit easier than Tinker. So... First off, this fight is all about communication. He will spawn some spark wraiths that will mute and uh, disable your allies. You have to hit these things first. It is essential that you hit these things first. If you don't, you're gonna start losing heroes and it's going to be a very, very difficult fight. Again, these things only die to right-click damage, so don't be spinning on them, don't be casting any spells, you have to right-click it. So ranged heroes, this is your number one job in this fight. Now, later in the fight, he will explode his personal bubble with a light strike array-like thing. Uh, that is very deadly for melee heroes, so please do be very careful. And he's gonna spawn more Arc Wardens. Your main focus should be to kill those guys. You don't want this thing to turn into a bullet hell because you forgot to kill those guys. But the most important attack 
is the big AoE one. Now this big AoE attack is pretty scary. If you get hit by any of these in the inner circles, you're probably gonna get bounced out into another one and you're probably gonna die. But fun fact about this one, if you go into the center and you stand directly on top of the Nemesis stone, that's the big shiny stone in the center, uh, you usually, and I'm talking like 99% of the time, will never get hit by anything. These things circle around that stone. And even if you are that close, it should be very apparent when one of those things might be able to hit you. So the majority of your damage for this entire fight will take place during this long channeling period, making the fight actually pretty easy once you get to this stage. Now, there's a couple cheese things you can do here. Uh, one of the best heroes for this one is Undying with Barry the Living. It's one of the only things that people can jump into the tombstone to avoid the birds, and it makes it a cinch to win. However, I think theoretically some other heroes might be able to do stuff like this. Tusk Snowball should work, and maybe Gyro's Missile Ride, but for the love of God, don't get Gyro's Missile Ride, okay? Uh, anything else but that. Suffice it to say, because of his giant AoE attack, which you should never get hit by now that you know the cheese around it, uh, this guy is actually pretty easy if you can make it past the bird stage. Also, if you're the last guy alive, I don't think he attacks you with birds anymore, so uh, it's kind of easy to clutch this one as well. And finally, the most dreaded of them all, Tanker. Now, Gaben, in all of his wisdom, did try to stop this boss from getting cheesed. But my friends, we have investigative journalists here in the game that have found ways to do it. In fact, here's the sneakiest one and it works easiest with Tinker. Now what you wanna do is get vision of Tinker without getting too close and then, check this out, hit a box. You see, hitting a box activates the fight yet he still doesn't have range of you and it tells the bosses that the fight has begun and thus they can be damaged. That's right. If you can get some tombstones next to it, you can still cheese everybody, especially this fucking Tinker. I hate you, Tinker, so cheese this bastard every time. He's a real piece of garbage. Tinker, I used to cheese this mother sucker with tombstone every single time. He is just a miserable bastard. Uh, not a lot of tips here I could give you, honestly. Every time that he does his rearm and he's about to TP, he will shoot rockets in an AoE, which makes uh, for very much damage, so you gotta dodge those. Also, he does marks on the machines, which are completely random. Sometimes they're very easy to dodge, other times they are literally impossible to dodge, so good luck with that. The lasers, though, are the big killers on this one. The lasers that he shoots do stay around for a long time. In fact, they stay around longer than the animation makes it look, so you really have to dodge those. Honestly, the worst part about this entire fight are the AoE circles if you have a gyrocopter on your team. This is literally unplayable if Calldown is being shot all over the place. I have no idea what to dodge. It's a goddamn nightmare in here. The one tip I can give you is his polymorph spell, AKA the uh, uh, thing that falls from the ceiling and turns you into a, a sheep. All right, this one is dodgeable. Check this out. He attacks you based on where you click to move your hero on the ground, meaning that good players with high APM, uh, they're gonna actually die to this more. You have to dumb yourself down and only click one, two, or three times during this phase, and then he won't be able to hit you. I know it sounds crazy, but that's actually how it works. It's nuts. So yes, the best way to beat this super smart guy is to be very stupid, which is why so many players die here, because he takes advantage of players that uh, naturally play the game a little bit better than others. Anyway, Tinker is a real monster. He is one of the only bosses that I would purposely cheese every time. I'd rather sit for 20 minutes hitting him with Tombstone. Uh, Yule Scepter is great here. Do buy Yules, and uh, that's the only advice I can give you. Good luck. And finally, the boss that strikes fear into all players. Put on the Dark Souls music, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Blob. This bastard has been nerfed and nerfed and nerfed, and he still takes out more players than any other room in this entire game mode. Like all other blobs in video game history, he splits when he gets attacked. However, these blobs make black holes, grabbing all the little guys. This black hole grows his AoE stun, which just devastates anybody that gets close. It's an insta-kill if he gets too many of these guys. Now, combining every little mob, being able to jump, chase you, and God forbid you're playing on Apex and they have modifiers, this room is an absolute slayer. But it's not so bad when you figure out how to beat it. 
The trick to the evil amoeba is to take out the tiny little blobs first, no matter what. Hitting the big guys doesn't do a lot because those tiny ones are the ones that are doing all of the damage. Now, this is confusing, though, because you think that just a blob is smaller. I'm talking about the tiny ones. No, I'm talking about the ones without the split health bars. There's a little symbol next to the bosses that show which ones are the bosses and which ones are tiny little bastards. You've got to hit the tiny ones first. If you try to focus on one of the lower HP boss amoebas, then you're going to have a lot longer killing it and it's going to get strong and destroy you. So you've got to clear out the little guys. Now, luckily for you, the best way to beat this room is how you usually beat every other room. AoE mob clearing stuff. If you have a lot of single target physical damage, well, I, I, I don't really know how you got here, but if you have that, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, kill the little guys in Blob Room. This one is also a speed test. Mostly your teammates are going to get you killed from dodging s giant stuns, and then you're going to walk into them. So try to slack circle this one. It really does help. So there you have it. They removed a lot of the cheese from these bosses, but they also uh, nerfed them a little bit too, so it should be a little bit easier for you. That's every boss in the game except for you know who, the big one, the final boss. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the Primal Beast. Now, as I said at the start of this guide, every single decision you make should be based on how does this help me beat the Primal Beast. Making it to the Primal Beast and losing is not the goal. It is to have the tools needed to defeat the boss. It is better to limp your way to the final boss and beat him than to make it there with five lives and then everybody dies. What is the most important part of this fight? Well, if you've been paying attention, the RA know it is speed. Most of the Primal Beast attacks are going to one-shot you, or at least almost one-shot you, and the best way to avoid death is with items that make you go faster. So make sure you prioritize movement speed over anything else. If you're wondering what to buy before the fight and you have 390 movement speed, well, I got a, a real good answer. Speed! Now, the Primal Beast has many attacks. Let's go through each and every one of them. First, his standard charge. He picks an ally and he charges at them. If you're being charged, please just, just gently walk from one side to another. Don't do some crazy blink or weird shit because he's gonna continue to follow you and that blink might surprise your allies and get three of them charged. Queen of Pains, listen up. Don't blink across the room when he's charging or you're gonna get one of your poor bastard allies killed. Now after the charge, he'll do rocks. Okay, the rocks are pretty easy to dodge. You simply walk towards the beast or left or right, depending on your speed. If you don't have enough speed, always walk towards the beast. If you're pretty quick, you can walk to the left or the right. Never walk away from the boss. This is designed to kill Dota players because Dota players naturally walk away from enemies because that's towards their fountain. This is how most people die. They get scared and then they run away from the rock, which will get you hit by the splitting rock behind them. Now, another big killer here is people dying to rocks centered on their allies. So do try to split up for the rock throwing phase. If you're a melee hero or if you do most of your damage close to your hero, go as close to the beast as humanly possible. You will not be targeted by rocks. And if you're a ranged hero or somebody that does, you know, some blinking around and shit, go kind of pretty far away from your allies. Not only does it help them not get hit by rocks, but it also makes sure that the next phase is even easier. Okay, next up, the Primal Beast will roar. He'll push people away from him. He'll silence them, and then he'll start walking towards somebody, pounding the ground like a big crazy monkey. All right, I've hardly ever seen anyone die. This is just a straight up movement speed test. If you don't have, I think, more than 400 movement speed, he is able to catch up to you and just insta-kill you. And silence is super deadly for heroes like Quap and Void Spirit, who typically don't build movement speed because they're so confident in their blink abilities. But this is straight-up movement speed test. Did you buy any speed items? If no, uh, he can easily smash it here. Now, after this maneuver, a lot of different things can happen depending on how much HP he has. He can go back to charging, he can go throw some rocks, or if he's missing enough HP, he'll do his next attack, which is to roar at one of your allies, leap over, and start ground pounding him. Primal Beast roars at an ally, they're stunned, he picks them up, and then he starts pounding them into the ground. Now, this uh, attack will never kill the person that is being grabbed. It does percentage-based 
damage. So no matter what, you'll never die from it if you're grabbed. However, he does toss you out when he's done with you, and sometimes he will toss you into some golems, which he spawned from his pounding phase earlier. So uh, that can be super deadly. Pretty much if you're thrown out, make sure that you have some kind of way to heal yourself. Pop that bottle, pop that Yules, and get the hell out of wherever he threw you. Anywho, if you're the one who's grabbed, you're actually the lucky one as your allies will have to deal with his AoE physical damage attack. Now this attack actually changes based on the difficulty. In the earlier, easier difficulties, there's going to be three kinds of circles, a red one, a yellow one, and a kind of goldish one. The goldish one is a bit of a red herring. That one actually doesn't even explode, but the red ones and the yellow ones, you know, the red will explode, the yellow turns into a red, then explodes. In higher difficulty levels, there are no golden circles. It is all just red and yellow. So you've got to be super careful against this physical damage. Now, some people will buy Ghost Scepter for this stage. Personally, I don't think it's very necessary. It's kind of a waste of money. It will make you invincible when you're about to get hit, but uh, maybe you have a Blink, maybe you have a Yules, maybe you have something else. I'll, I'll tell you one thing you can have, goddamn legs. After the Primal Beast is done with its charging phase, you guys want to spread out as far away from each other as you can in the arena, just in case somebody gets grabbed. The further you go from each other and the center, the better. When he grabs somebody, everyone should yell out what direction to run away from, and you can run in the opposite direction of the ground pound. Now, if you do this right, the ground pound does not cover up the entire arena, making it particularly easy. You simply walk away and then you're out of the giant AOE. This means that nobody has to dodge, nobody has to use items, and it's super simple to get through this phase. I mean, I do this literally every time I fight him. If someone gets grabbed, I say run south and then I run south, and typically no one ever dies. While you're on the outside of the AoE, this is the perfect time for you to be nuking those golems that spawned, getting those little guys out of the arena so that it's just you and the Primal Beast making your job just a hell of a lot easier. Then he's going to go back to his normal attack pattern. That's going to be charging three times, then throwing rocks, then hitting the ground as he chases someone, and then eventually going back for that AoE slam until he is at half health or less. After this is over, after his half health down, he's going to start his most deadly attack, the business. He pounds the ground with both fists, causing shock waves to go across, dealing obscene amounts of magical damage. Now, these things split and get absolutely crazy, as if that wasn't bad enough. The longer the fight goes on, the more time he does this, the more spawn and the faster they go. So as soon as he's at half health, you're on a real timer to get rid of the beast. Now, I told you Ghost Scepter might not be worth your time to buy for the physical attacks. I will say, if you have the money, buying a BKB for this phase is pretty damn good. You never know when you're going to be in the wrong position for this bad boy. You never know when you'll be at the wrong angle and just getting showered in these things. So BKB is a great purchase. In fact, some of the best heroes in this game mode have inbuilt BKBs just to survive this terrifying phase. And that's what makes heroes like Juggernaut or Kunkka or Dawnbreaker so actually good. Suffice it to say, Wind Waker is also a fantastic way to get around this phase as well. You can dodge for as long as you can, and then right before a couple are going to hit you, the Wind Waker uptime will usually get you through. If you do Wind Waker, use that opportunity to move actually closer to the beast, as the closer you get to the Primal Beast, the easier these things are to dodge, typically. Anyway, for the first couple rounds, these things are not that hard. You simply walk towards the exploding line when it's a single one, and it should eh, bow out to be a double one, and you just walk right through. But the longer the fight goes on, the more impossible this gets. Now, I've heard legends of being able to stand in front of a primal beast's face, and then you dodge his right pound, and you dodge his left pound, and people swear by this shit. I've literally never seen it before. No one has uh, provided me with a replay of them not dying, standing point blank in front of his face and dodging ground pounds. If you have one, uh, shoot it over, asshole, because to me, that shit's a goddamn fable. Okay, so what's my biggest advice for the Primal Beast to build for this attack? This attack is the one that kills everybody. All the other attacks can basically be fixed with speed, but this is the one that's going to take you out. So if you have an opportunity to grab any shard that allows you to have BKB, uh, pick that up. If you can buy a BKB, 
and you have enough move speed, pick that up. If you can get a Wind Waker, pick it up. This is really the only thing that you need to dodge in this fight. It's the real killer. So, I mean, you want to hear my real advice? Pick Juggernaut. Guy is magic immune for 99% of the entire time if you uh, spin. That's why I picked Juggernaut. I couldn't beat the goddamn Primal Beast, so I just started playing Juggernaut. He can do it by himself. It's great. Other weird interactions. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple things. Uh, for one, some heroes like Bane with his nightmare thing can fly over. I hear Drow has an ability that saves everybody. Uh, you can go inside Tombstone during this. In fact, Tombstone zombies actually tank hits. Uh, for this and some other summons tank hits for this as well, but I'll just be real with you guys buy BKB Get some magic immunity plan to have some kind of escape for this because it's the most important part of your entire playthrough So on that note, let's talk about items again You can itemize based on what you think you need either magical or physical uh, Protection, but I would always say prioritize your movement speed and make sure that you have a few lives. Roshan should be bought out for all of his lives one way or another. I don't know what item you think you're buying, but it's not better than an extra life. If you have full lives, don't forget, you can buy more and they'll drop to the ground and be able to be picked up by your allies, which is really good. A lot of people buy heart, boots to travel, ghost scepter. Uh, personally, I think these are garbage. Honestly, you shouldn't need that much help with the AOE ground slam, especially if you walk out of the AOE of it. If you get grabbed by the ground slam and you don't have a lot of HP, a lot of people claim they get heart for this. I, you got bottle charges. It doesn't happen to you that often, and you should have some way to get health back at this point. Boots of travel? Who cares? Buy Wind Waker. It dodges everything. Don't pick BKB, Ghost Scepter, Boots of Just buy Wind Waker. It dodges it all, baby. Blink Dagger is also fantastic in case you get into a bad spot. I would rather you upgrade your Blink into a Strength Blink than buy yourself a heart. Finally, remember, Primal Beast doesn't have that much health. What he has is a lot of armor. So if you want to do damage, and I'm talking non-magical damage, you're going to want to pick armor reducers like Desolator, like Solar Crest. Anything that you can pick up to reduce armor is much, much better than getting anything that does pure unadulterated damage. Okay, with all that aside, and you're still losing to the final boss on Apex, what is the best cheese? Well, let me tell you, because there's several. First, we have the most famous, of course, Undying. With Bury the Living and high enough cooldown reduction, you can solo the boss if all of your allies die. Simply put down a tombstone, hide inside, then jump out and put down another tombstone. Primal Beast does not aggro onto these tombstones, thus he just never hits them. He, he doesn't do anything. He just sits there, slowly dying to zombies, while you get up and go get yourself a drink. Uh, you AFK beat the game. Is it rewarding? No. Will it beat Apex Mage? Absolutely. All right, now if this is too pathetic for you, do what I did, just pick Juggernaut. Juggernaut can cheese this entire game mode and he can cheese this boss super, super easy. Again, you wanna focus on your spin shards and just in case you don't have the cooldown, you buy yourself a Wind Waker. The most deadly thing that he does does not hit you Super easy again. Juggernaut is the only one in the game that can actually damage him during that split attack that everyone's so scared of. I, I have beaten the Primal Beast so many times completely by myself with Juggernaut. Jesus, I beat it for Purge for God's sakes. Uh, it's literally impossible to beat this game mode with Purge and even I carried Purge solo as Juggernaut. J literally impossible. Now my favorite cheese here is the Yule's cheese. During the rock throwing phase, after he throws the first rock, if you Yule's while the second rock is in mid air, it screws up the primal beast for some reason. He goes and reverts back to his original attack cycle where he simply charges. Now again, the attack cycle is charge rocks. So if you Yule's during the second rock over and over and over again, Literally, all he does is charge and throw one rock. This only works, by the way, if you are alone, if you're the last guy there. I mean, technically, it could work if everybody in your party yules at the exact same time. If you pull that one off, send me a video. I'd love to see it. But usually, this is the way that you can solo the Primal Beast if you're the last man alive. It should be easy to do. If you have an Octarine core, you got the Yules, you should be able to Yules for that second rock every single time, leading him to just being stuck into a charge phase. 
Now, depending on the character you're playing, are you ever going to be able to damage him as he charges back and forth? Uh, maybe not. In fact, the only time you're able to damage him, potentially, is when he's throwing the first rock. So if you picked the wrong character for this, uh, enjoy the three hours of damaging him once every 45 seconds. Now, some heroes have this ability, like Tusk, Bane, Phoenix. They can also make this untargetable uh, selection here if they're alone, and they could do this on the rock phase, which is another way to reset this phase. Also, as I said, Slark used to be able to leash him when he was jumping. This also resets his phase, and it's the easiest way for you to cheese the final boss. Now, you'll notice that I didn't talk about Bane or Winter Wyvern in this one. Yes, I've seen the videos of people spawning a billion goddamn golems and then having them kill the final boss uh, this is a fun meme but uh, don't try this on apex for the love of god keep that stuff in apprentice one to showcase to your friends so that they think that you're cool for the first time in your life you're not cool stop coming into my games trying to do it Overall, just remember, the Primal Beast cannot heal. Any bit of damage that you deal to him is very good damage. It all counts. Also, fun fact, if you're really bad at doing the Yule's trick and you go into the Shockwave phase, you can play for so long that the Shockwaves move so fast they don't even split. There's a certain limit to it. You, you actually make it easier if you survive for a really, really long time. I would not recommend this. That sounds awful. And that's all I got for the final fight. The final fight is hard because it's the least practiced that you will be until you finally beat it. So have some fun if you get really desperate. Pick on dying before they fix it because they're probably going to fix it as soon as this video's over. I Valve, that's going to piss them off when they find out about that one. Don't do it. D -d -d do it now. Bonus rooms, boys! Couldn't really think of a good transition to these stupid things, so let's just talk about them. Now, for each round, there's a chance that you could get a bonus room where you can make a neat little deal. Let's go through each of them, and I'll tell you what to do. Warlock. You get a skill book, a tome, or a special... A uh, do something good when hit book or maybe you get a neutral item. I, I don't know. It's kind of random tomes are great I usually get those if it gives you a cool spell book like the dazzle heal or the kunkka if you get hit I pick those up almost every time. You never know when they might save your life Slark room. I never take this I feel like there are very few times when I make it to the end and say god. I wish I had more money uh, You know what I do uh, miss is being healed before I die uh, I really, really don't think this one is ever kind of worth it. Unless you're playing in the easier difficulties and you just want to see how broken you can get. Uh, if your hero does have innate healing abilities, like, uh, I don't know, undying, this might be worth your time because you're not going to use heal potions that much anyway to heal. But honestly, the hardest part of the run is in the earlier part of the rooms. And uh, you don't have a lot of heals in those early parts. So why would you make it harder on yourself I, I don't know, man. I, I never get this. Naga Room. I love this one. Uh, bottles. You guys know how I feel about the bottle. I think it's the best one. Fifth bottle charge every time. The other things that she offers, uh, they're stupid. Double damage room. Who cares? Just get the fifth bottle. Uh, nothing is better than an extra life. Doom, another good one. I've never noticed the impact of this 666 regen nerf. Uh, if you're confident you can make it to the next Roshan, however, it is always worth it to let him take one health and then get 1,500 gold or 600 gold or whatever. Uh, especially if you have the Roshan discounts, this is such a good deal if you're confident that you're going to be able to just go buy another life. It's awesome. Fun fact, by the way, if you have magic lamp, he can't kill you. He will actually put you down to death and it will not work. I've tested this with the precious egg many times. Uh, it's never procced, but uh, there is a possibility it could. I did test this with the Book of Shadows, though. That shit does not work. He will kill you. Okay, the Brewmaster Room. This one's pretty easy. I just, I don't buy anything. I'm a cheap piece of shit. I just get, get whatever you don't have to pay for. Very easy. Necro room. I, I don't even remember what he offers. That's how bad it is. I think it's like a permanent reduction of your HP. It, it's off. Don't, don't give up HP, especially when he's offering you a random shard. Uh, it is the stupidest one out there. Just take the shard every single time. Tinker. Okay, that's a good one. I take the right click damage nerf every single time to get the extended cast range. I mean, I, I don't actually think you take the right click damage on any hero. 
Okay, maybe Templar Assassin? Maybe that's the only one that you buff your right click damage uh, range? But honestly, having more AoE for spells on literally every hero is good. Uh, I take it every time. Clinks, maybe? Maybe Clinks? But he has so many abilities. Like the skeletons. Don't you want to shoot more skeletons? Uh, I don't know, man. Just take the take the range. Morphling. Who gives a shit? This one is inconsequential. This is the stupidest one out. Well, who fucking cares? I'm right at the end. What do I want? 20 more HP? Thanks a lot, Morphling. Sick, dude. Sick, sick. And the actual important ones. The two tinies. Now there's a big old tiny. This guy's a piece of garbage. Don't take this one ever. I mean, they even nerfed this one where it's not so bad and it only reduces your move speed, I think, by 75 instead of capping you. But still, move speed is life. Have you been have you been listening to the video at all? Move speed is everything. Don't ever nerf your move speed. Holy Jesus. Don't even walk up to this fat, stupid idiot. Don't get this ever. Unless you're like tanking on Apprentice 1. Then it's okay, I guess. And little tiny, inversely, this guy's the best one. Take it every time. Move speed is life. This guy gives you incredible move speed. In fact, there's a little hack I can teach you. Drop all your items before you talk to this guy. If anything gives you HP, he will actually reduce the amount that he takes away from you, which makes it doubly good. He takes like a 200 health and it gives you unlimited move speed. Little Tiny is great. Not only that, but you could scream, I'm just a baby. Who would hurt a baby? Who'd hurt a little guy? I do it every time. It's very annoying. Super good. Get it every single time. It's a run changer, baby. That trick I mentioned, by the way, you do have to drop your items before you go into the Tiny room, apparently. You drop all your items on the ground before you go see Tiny, and then you'll get much, much less health taken away. It's very good. Very good. Very true. Try it. All right, finally, the, the stupid ogre. Uh, you can either get a neutral item or you can bet. I always bet. He always screws me. I hate the ogre. Uh, I bet every time, though. You gotta bet, guys. Hello guys, now it is time for the part of the guide that I know you're here for. It's time for the trap rooms. Now there are many different hacks and tricks I have for you for the trap rooms. In fact, the first one is, is that your speed has already increased. All the trap rooms were designed around 350 movement speed. Valve gave you a little 10 movement speed buff. So inherently the trap rooms are a little bit easier. Also, as I said about a hundred times, if you have a blink dagger, the first person in the room, you can blink through and skip these ones. I'll try to make a note of which ones we do. But anyway, I'm gonna walk you through every single trap room, every single one, and tell you exactly where to stand, exactly how to do it, and exactly what to look out for. So let's go. We're gonna go through every single one of them in order-ish. They are kind of random, so who knows what is gonna happen. All of this footage, by the way, I did all the trap rooms. I practiced it. It was gathered by a great community member named Gage. And, uh, I'm not gonna edit the video. We're gonna just keep moving. Here we go. Okay, guys, first up is Thaslophobia. Now, this one's gonna probably be the longest one because there's a lot of concepts I wanna talk to you guys about that. And these concepts are gonna carry over to every single trap room that we do. So we're gonna take it a little slow and then we'll speed it up, don't worry. Everything's in the description. You can click to the trap room that you want. Things will go faster, but let me get a few things out of the way. Now, the first trap you're gonna see in all these rooms are the, the Breath of Rios, these fire guys. A basic rule here is you stop and you wait to see if it shoots three times. It changes every time that you load in. Some of these guys readjust and they shoot three times. Sometimes they don't. Patience is what kills you in the trap rooms. Being impatient and being nervous. There's nothing to be nervous about. Take your time, stand in front of it, and see if it shoots. As you guys see right here, we're gonna do exactly that. We're gonna wait until it shoots and we're gonna move on. Now these things have unlimited fire. They are actually connected to the money that people spend on the battle pass in Gaben's vault. And these things will burn for a thousand years. It's like a tire fire over yes. at Valve. Uh, every single time that you bought a shitty Drow Ranger cosmetic, uh, it burns into this blue flame. Oh, okay, now that's a button. You see right there, this little guy right here, this button? Uh, if you press that, that's a pressure plate that activates the breath of Rio. So you have to wait, see if you're gonna be safe, you check for the triple, and then you move on. Now here we go, this is a double. Anytime that you see two of these double breath of Rios, you should probably wait till they fire at the same time. The two signs that you're free and safe are when they triple fire, or two of them fire at the same time. They will always do a fire at the same time. So for me, I'm patient, I wait for the risk, and I go during the double. All right, now, here we go. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a pressure plate. Now, when you press the pressure plate, an arrow's gonna come out somewhere. The cool trick about these is that most of them, 99% of them, you can just pick somewhere on the map, hands off your keyboard, and you're guaranteed that your character will go to a safe place if you clicked on the right position. And this one, I'm gonna click right to the left of this uh, button, and you'll be just fine. Check this out. Is. Boom! Piece of cake. You know that you're gonna make it as long as you know that you have the safety away from the arrow. Your movement speed will always be good enough. We're gonna track for a triple here. One, two, three. And Too that bad. means that we are safe to move on. All right, now. This configuration here, this is called a triple triple. You gotta see if this guy in the middle shoots three flames. If it does, you move then. If it doesn't, you just move. There's two pressure plates, no big deal. We're gonna click where we know that the pressure plates click. won't hurt us right there. And now we've got these firing plates as well. Pick a safe spot. It's right here by this little clam. That is a clam. Yes. Okay, it's not a mollusk. And there is our first treasure chest. So let's go ahead and wait to see if this is a triple. Not a triple. It. That means we can go hit the button. The precious egg. Guys, did you know you can switch out the precious egg into your inventory and it does have a chance to actually proc? It can save your life. It's very good. Okay, this is the second most dangerous part of this one. You walk up this hill, there's a breath right there. It does fire triple shots and it's in the dark. So you have to look at it from the darkness before you go up that hill. Very dangerous. But as you can see, one, two, three, I know it's safe and then I can move down. All right. Hey. Hardest part right here, you can use your abilities if you have them. This is the time to use those abilities. These guys, it can go triple on the top, then one on the bottom, triple on the bottom, one on the top. Basically, you want to wait for the triple and then go on that side. Now, the trickiest part is if you just click on the end of this, your character will naturally try to go the bottom route, which gets a lot of people killed. So on this one, you do have to click as you walk through the trap. Typically, I take the top. I always think that one's the slower one. Go after they shoot and manually click your way through if you just click once you're gonna die here Wait. check it out here we go wait for the shot and there we go oh my god that's some high apm right there that's good that's yes. i am good i am good and you can count on that one then let that money burn for a thousand years all right next up is the estate end though we got a lot more breath of rio traps over here and uh, we got some new ones so let's take a look first things first very easy these are long shots what they are gonna do these long boys here they're gonna fire one shot it's gonna go forever typically you want to go as soon as the shot passes you that is my number one trick for getting rid of these it's very easy uh they hardly ever kill you again we're about to go into a button we're gonna see if this one triple shots it does not triple shot we know the button is safe hit that button baby like my wife pushing my buttons knowing that she gets away with it without any bad uh things hearts come out ain't that nice again up here is a blind rio you gotta wait and see if it triple shots one two three rio rio i don't know what the hell these things are called they sh blue shooty flame now this is a little crazy you can just go on the right here and circumvent both the buttons i like pressing the buttons because it makes me feel elite makes me feel cool check for a triple not a triple move our way up button time now this button will kill a lot of your allies if your allies are stupid impatient and crowding around you in your back <laughs> a little fucking vermin tell them to wait wait get away from me i'm about to hit this button it could kill you every time that i hit a button i say get away from the button and uh, typically people will believe you. You're gonna wait for these long shot, long shot over. You know you can click anywhere. Button gonna miss you. Oh, that's another chest right there. Oh, that's another heart right there. And then you're gonna move your way on as soon as that fire gets around you. Now this is our first encounter with our real triple triple. Two shooters and one button. Again, you're gonna wanna wait for both of these to line up and fire at the same time. That's when you know that you're most safe. However, these are random. So sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta look at it and say, this is my moment, this is it. Typically, it's on the back of one of these guys doing a triple shot. Let's go ahead and see how I make it through this one, guys. On to three! And then I got nervous. And then, it's okay to be nervous. Take your time. One, two, three! And then I got nervous. Hey, take your time. And not all the combinations are correct. These are literally random. There was a double shot. That's where I should have gone. There's another double shot! Double shots are always safe. Always safe on the double. Always go on the double. All right. This is the part where you're going to want to use any kind of uh, bonuses that you have. It's very dangerous, but it's not too bad. You're going to want to click on the left of these double shooters here. We're going to wait. Again, I'm going to wait for that double shot. It's going to come. It's going to come. While you think about the double shot, think about how much time you've wasted in Dota 2. How many uh, different jobs you could have. How, what a profession you could have. What kind of millionaire you could be by, by you know, piling up your NFTs of whatever the fuck. Here we go. All right, fantastic. You want to click there. Now you're safe. Now this is the biggest 
danger here. A lot of people click this button and they hit the panel on the bottom. That's a red herring. You want to hit the button, go top. After it shoots, it's a long shot. Follow the shot, walk top, then come back and you'll be fine. All right, check this out. Going to hit the button. We're going to go top. <laughs> then we're going to come back. You're not going to make it the whole way, all right? You think you're, you think you're Long Dick Johnson over there? You're not going to make it the whole way. You know your place. Know you're a tiny little guy. Go back to where you belong and hope for the best. That's how my marriage has been functioning for a long time. Okay, now, the bridges to Bedlam. This one is big danger. Big danger. This is a scary button. But what did I tell you? I told you if you hit these buttons, you click on one place on the map, you're going to make it. Your move speed is going to be fine. So you just click the button and wait. You're going to uh, watch for this breath of Rio right here, Gaben's wallet, burning your money, burning everything that could have bought you your first house so that you weren't an embarrassment to your parents. There you go. Look at that movement speed. Perfect. As I told you. Now, pressure plate right here, piece of cake, check for triple. One, two, three. That means I could go pressure plate. I, this isn't even a trap. This is literally, are you stupid? Are you stupid? That's the trap. But well, you're going to go anyway. All right, this part looks scary. It's not. Again, you just pick your safe spot. Wait for the triple shots. One, two, three. Make my move. Here's the double triple right here. Got to wait for that double shot. Where's the double shot? And again, it's random every time. It's very scary. Where's the double shot? Got to be patient. Why are you doing this? Think about your favorite hero in Dota and why they're not in Agnum's labor. Then open up an email and get ready to write a thread on our Dota 2. And then look at that thread. Look at your karma and think to yourself, Jesus, I'm pathetic. Right, Jeez, cool. there's the double shot. Here we go. And now you got the chest. Easy peasy. Very nice. And now we're going to move past this one. Wait for the triple. Is it a triple? That's what gets you killed. Impatience. Impatience kills both in real life and inside the Agnum's room. Wait for the triple. And is this one a triple? Every single time I wait. Some kid in the back on the back, you know, guy in his in his big Toyota trick pickup truck behind me in the trap room. <laughs> Fucking wait. All right, I'm going. All right, that's your safe spot right there. You're fine. Here we go. This is a long shot. Again, long shot. You're going to want to wait. Here's your safe spot right here. You don't want to hit the button. You hit the button, you're in a real bad spot. So put your cursor over this. Wait for the fire to go past you. And then you know that you're safe. All right, this is fucking crazy. This is the one. Bridges to Bedlam is actually the scariest one out of all of them. This button is horrific. Now, what you want to do is go completely left as fast as you can over the bridge. However, I swear to God, this one is based off turn speed of your hero. I know your movement speed is the same, 360, but you have got to get so close to the bottom left of this bridge for some heroes. You have to go microscopic. So if you can, if you're playing a hero with a really bad turn speed, get as low as you can to the left and then make your run. All right, let's take a look at this run here. Waiting for the triple shot. That's my sign that I'm safe. One, two, three. And I know I can go. Oh, Jesus Christ. Did you see that shit? That was crazy. Sand King's got a great turn rate, though. He's going to be fine. Don't forget the chest back there, big boy. All right, if you made it this far, if you're watching this guide, you're the best dude on your team. You need to get those chests. All right, Jeff Bezos that shit. Get in there. That's not meant for the common man. That's meant for me. Climb that ladder and kick it down, baby. That's how it works in capitalistic Agnum's labor. Now, that's a dangerous move I did right here. This little guy, this little chest here, this little torch is an invisible wall. Typically, I like to walk on the other side and just loop around. This is something you could do. I wouldn't recommend it. Advanced users only. All right. You can walk here. Again, not really. This is the slow version because, I, you know, I think you need help. You can just walk through a bunch of this shit. There you go. Boom, boom, boom. Bitches. British Bedlam. Jailbreak. La ladies and gentlemen, Slarky Malarkey. It's you. You're getting out of Dark Reef Prison. That's the lore. Check for the triples, as always. One, two, three. And we're going to make our way. Easy peasy. Look at this. Look at Dark Reef Prison, man. How many Slardars have been locked down here? How many, how many Slytherin have rotted? That's a hidden button right there, guys. You see that? That's a hidden button. Put your fucking glasses on. That's a hidden button. Boom. You're going to be okay as long as you click anywhere. Check for a triple. We're good. Pressure plate. Don't stand still. Proceeds. One, two, three. That means you're safe. Go up this hill. Treasure chest down to the right. You can get that if you feel like it. I didn't. It's not even hard. Now, this one, again, check for the triples. Walk. And as always, guys, if there's a button, you can walk. The move speed is fine. You know what? I'm, let's go and get that chest. I changed my mind. I'm going to go for it. That's the easiest way to go for it. If you feel like being a real Chad, you feel like really, really putting one over to the, the other nerds in the game, just click. It's fine. You're going to make it. Everything's fine. Okay, moving on up. There's another chest up here, big Chad boy. All right. We're not at a dark reef yet. We're going to check for triples. The breath of Rio, the blue flame. 
Oh no. my god, it's so scary. Click on the chest, grab the heart if you feel that way. I don't, I leave the hearts. Even if I don't, if I have zero hearts, I leave the hearts. Because people need to know how good I am. Alright. Making my way downtown. Here we go. The double, tri oh, that's the triple shot right there. You know it's safe. Boom. It must be Easy. Last one again. Click on that safe spot. Anywhere on the left should be fine. You're gonna make it with the movement speed. Woo! Look at that shit. For my little tail. And then wait for the triple. One, two, three. I and we're Slark broke out of Dark Reef. We walked out of Dark Reef, Bravey. We are Dark Reef. Eat shit, Slardar. Let's keep moving. Crispy Calamity. This one's a lot of fun. Again, a lot of triple shots. Like You're gonna wait at the breath there. You're gonna make your woo. Here's the double triple right here. We gotta wait for that double triple. You don't hit that double triple. You're gonna get fried, baby. You're gonna be fried crispier than a, than a, than a chicken. I don't know what else you fry. Uh, a lot of my wife keeps telling me to get an air like fryer. I don't believe in that. There's a long shot right there. Wait for the long shot again. You're gonna walk as soon as that fire passes you. This one's dangerous. Let's talk about chests. Chests like this are very dangerous. They're there to kill you. What you want to do is click on the area around the chest. If you click on the chest, your character will stop in the fire and die. If you're highlighting the chest with green, that actually means stop in Agnum's labor. It's green means stop. Because if you click on it, you're gonna die. You want to click to the north, the south, the east, the west, anywhere but on top of the chest so that you can get into a safe spot and open it. See? Like this. Check this out. No green. No mean. I'll, I'll take that heart this time. You know, I feel frisky. I'm going to take it. And we walk our way out. All right. Here's another button here. Pick your safe spot. One click is all it needs. I'm going to massively click because I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. And then here we go. You don't even have to click on this button. It's just kind of fun in case somebody's riding your ass and somebody's right behind you and you say, all right, dude, back up. You don't need to be so close to me. I'm doing the traps. And if he keeps going on you, you could just go to the right here. You don't even have to click the button. But you feel like doing a little, a little cheeky homicide as OD Pixel puts it. A little, a little shaky, a little shaky fucking stab in his, in his eye, mate. Yes. As OD P Pixel says on a daily basis to me, uh, you can hit that button. Anyway, here, you just tuck into the side. Piece of cake. Again, buttons. You don't have to worry Tobacco. about them. This was a pl pressure plate. NBD. No big deal. L337. 332. Piece of cake. Walk on. Is that a triple? Oh, yeah. Don't be impatient. Always check. All right. Now we're going to walk over here. This is the part where you're going to want to use any kind of speed boost that you have or anything else. You simply walk to the left. We've done it a billion times. So you've been paying attention. Walk to the fucking left. All right. Check for a triple. Is it a triple? We just saw a triple. And that's your sign to go. And we're going to go there. We're going to dodge that arrow by simply walking like a human being or some sort of animal. Long shot right here. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. No problem. We're just going to go as soon as it passes us. Ah! Now, this is a trick in the traps, my friend. This is a pressure plate that's not lined up. You need to stand on the plate and then wait for the fire. Then you can stand off the plate. This is your first uh, time ever seeing something like that. So we're going to stand on that. We're going to wait. Going to check for a triple. Not a triple. So we're going to make our way. Piece of cake. All right, here we go. This one. Do you have the ability to click? If so, you're going to make it. If not... This is the test. Wow, I can click, so I'm fine. All right, now this is the most famous murder chest in the entire trip. There's two famous murder chests. This is this is B. We'll go to A later. Uh, this one, not so scary, though, because this first plate, yes, that's right, it's a, it's a trick plate. You can stand on the plate and hit the chest. Piece of cake. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Most likely. Any moment now. I'll do it. Just wait. Be patient, for God's sake. I keep telling you guys to be patient in these trap rooms. Okay, you know, I, I actually go on top of the chest. You don't have to. I forgot. All right, let's talk about this trap. This is where everybody dies in this room. These two bastards are going to shoot one at the same time, and then the top one is not going to shoot one. The simple trick every single time, even if it's not this, it does flip it up. We're playing an Apex Mage right now, so it does change it up. As soon as both fire, you walk on the top one, and then you get your way through. If you walk on the bottom one, you're going to die. So check it out. To fire, as soon as those two are done, you walk on the top one, and you exit. There you go. Walk on the top one, and then you exit. That's all you gotta do. Piece of cake. Crispy calamity. Uh, next, uh, caverns of catastrophe. This one, pretty similar to crispy calamity. That one's a tricky one. You gotta wait for this guy to shoot, and then make your move. Move when it shoots, because you're gonna be following it out. Now, anyway, uh, here we go. Pressure plates. This one's gonna shoot. Pick your spot. Hands off the keyboard. Here we go. Boop. 
no problem at all. I'm fine. <laughs> Another pressure plate. This one's really tricky. The far one is the one that gets you killed. You have to go to the tight one. You have to go right there on that one. The first little crevasse, as the French would say, and then you'll be okay. If you go for that second crevasse, you're not going to make it. That's the forbidden crevasse. Uh, here we go. This one's a little tricky. You got to move pretty quick around this corner or you're going to die. Whoop! Again, this one is a little bit on turn speed. Some heroes will die on this one more easy than others and have to take that corner a lot tighter. Here we go. Woo! Now that's a sneaky button right there. Check this out. It's, it's hidden underneath the water. It's pretty crazy. Not that it does anything because if you literally just click past it, you're fine. All right, we're going to check for the triples again. Is this a triple? One? No, it's fine. Is this a triple? No, but I know this is a triple. Whatever. Anyway, we're going to keep going. Missed a chest back there, by the way, on the right. Uh, it's just buttons and triples. It's NBC. Oh, my God. I I'm going to go back for it. I mean, this is a guide, after all, for God's sakes. That is that's very accurate of what's going to happen to you in this room. Remember, don't highlight the chest. If you highlight the chest, you're going to die. Got to click away from the chest. Click on it. Boom, shakalaka. We got that 817 gold here in 1-4. Literally game-breaking. Up here dangerous there's a button right there you see that you don't want to click on that button click north to make sure that you don't die there we go get as close as you can and then get ready to run through this one after checking for a triple one two three uh it's fine all right make it our way now this part a lot of people die in i literally don't know why you wait for this to shoot and then there's another crevasse if you will as the french would say it a muy crevasse and then there you go all right this one's tricky because this is uh, really weird. Uh, when you're getting the chest for the first time, you can just run north, east, I believe. I'm not sure. I've never known the difference between east and west, but I know that that's north. So you can run north here. The button won't kill you if you just run north. It will kill you, however, if you run to the right on your way in. On your way out, it won't do that. So you can just run north, pick up the chest. Yoo-hoo! And then we're gonna run back. You can go straight through it. I like to go on the right and then cross over on the left. This is a Chad move right there because that should hurt you. But you know, that's Chad energy saving your life here. Check for triples. Uno, dos, tres. No problem. All right, this is our first. Okay, I actually forgot about that. That's wild. Let's watch that one again. Uh, that's fantastic. I didn't even know. I, I forgot about that one. Holy Tony. Jesus, that's crazy. Anyway, you're supposed to hit that first button, then run to the right, hit that second button, then double back to the left. But that's what idiots do. Now, you're watching the Sir Action Slacks uh, Agnum Scepter Bible here. Don't be an idiot. Just walk to the... Literally just walk past this shit. Ha! Dumbasses. Anyway, uh, piece of cake. Bruno Uno Crevasse. You did it. The Tangled Toil. The Tangled Toil. Right. Tangled Toil. All right, again, those are long shots. You're going to wait for the long shot to pass you, then you're going to walk through. Try to time it with this guy in the middle that shoots because you don't want to hit it on the booty. You don't want to hit it at the end of that shot. And then sit there waiting for the button. Make sure that's safe. Pick your spot. Pick your click. There it is. Piece of cake. And we're moving More on. Right. Here we go. Check for a triple. This one is your first encounter with the fake out button. Now, we know that the right is safe. And then you think, how do I get out of this situation? Because as soon as I step on something, I'm going to die. This is your first time with a fake out button. You click on this button, wait for it to shoot. And guess what? As long as you stay on the button, it won't shoot again. So after it's done shooting, you simply walk off, you glorious man. And then you're, you're absolutely fine. You can just walk your way through. Here we go. The double pressure plate. Again, we're going to wait for a triple. Or just go. Whatever. And then we're going to see right here. One, two, three. Waiting for triple. Checking for triples. Is this a triple, I wonder? One. One, two, three. It is. And that means we're safe. One, two, three. It is. It is safe. Bring your baby in. Bring your toddler in when you do trap rooms. And he'll. you can teach him how to count to three. Uh, anyway, this one is a little difficult. Again, you should be able to get to your destination by living as long as you pick the closest one after you hit the button. So you're going to want to look at the trap. Wait for a triple. One. We saw it didn't have a triple. Yes, so we go. All right, here we go. We're safe. Going to check for trips. We're fine. Yeah, I got a little nervous here, but it's all good. All right, coming up here. Double shot. These ones always line up, which is nice. It's very easy to get through. The chest again. Don't click on the green, guys. Yes. There you go. Green means no. 
And this is the part where everyone dies. This is the part where you want to use your spell bonuses on Tangle Coil. It's a little complicated. You see that skull? You see that monkey skull? That crystal skull right there? That elongated skull? Neanderthal uh, skull? That's a real species, by the way. You're going to want to aim for that. Wait for the long shot to pass you. Line it up with the other one. Click on that, that nasty skull. Or you just click on the button. I like the skull. I think it's cooler. Because that button does get you killed. This fire goes pretty far. If you're not standing on the tippity top of that button, it's dangerous. Now, this chest is the real killer. People see that chest and neuron activated monkey brain. Oh, 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 and they want to click on that chest. Calm, the, calm down, Neanderthal. Okay, you're a human. Think about it. Time it up. Just click next to the chest. Already One, two, three. We're good. Jesus. I almost died there. No big deal. Click on this bad boy. And then we're going to walk forward. Boom. All right, now you got the double shots. You've bypassed the buttons. Everything is well. You just have to wait for these double shots. Watch out for the pressure plate right here. That's the run ender. Wait for them to line up with the double. You can see the triple right there. That means I can go. Weehoo! And then we go. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. We did it again. That's Tangled Coil. All right, Torch at the Temple. Uh, this one is uh, it's pretty tough. This one gets a little rough here. You got to wait for the triple at the front. You're going to see if it fires three. It doesn't. Or does it? Yeah, we're gonna go. Now, this button will get your allies killed, so always say, I'm stepping on the button! And then step on the button. Uh, right is a lot harder. I like to go with to challenge myself Dead here. Again, you step drifted. on the buttons here. You wait on that. That's a trick button. So, as soon as you're off of that, you're free to go what yet again. There's a nasty chest right here. This gets some people killed. Don't click on the green. <laughs> click next to it. Well, then make your way out for that smooth 970 gold it's wild triple shot right there wait for your turn all right this is part one where everyone dies at torch of the temple what you want to do here is hit the button and go on the right if you go on the left you're gonna get smoked here all right you gotta wait for the shots on the right and then you make your move okay piece of cake Right, that's a, don't go on the left. Left kills every time. Again, this button does literally nothing except for kill people that are impatient behind you. Always warn you when you're about to hit a button. This is scary as well. Another uphill shot. Look for that uphill. Make sure it doesn't triple shot. One. One. And you're fine. All right. This is... Do you know how to walk? You've made it this far. Can you walk? Can you click? Good. Check for triples. Don't get lazy. Don't get impatient. So many people die on this part because they're like, eh, it's fine. It's fine. I can walk. And then they die. All right. Here's the stinky poo-poo lake. We, we love the stinky poo-poo lake. Oh, what a beautiful wash we get in that lake. First time your body's probably felt water in a long time. Now, this just gets a lot of people killed. You got to hit the button, tuck up, tuck left, hit the panel, get around. Now, it's all extremely complicated. Or, check this out. Or, you could literally just do none of that. Now, uh, it's your choice. You can go and hit the button, double back, hit the pressure plate, double back, go through the two fires, or you could just not. Uh, up to you. I choose not to because I'm a lazy piece of human garbage. All right. This one is the big killer, okay? You can click on this button. Obviously, you go to the left, right? That one's fairly obvious, but here's the big killer. Now, most people think you click on the button, you hide to the right. Don't ever do that. That's how you get torched at the temple, baby. If you hide under that second shooter, the arrow actually goes through it for some reason. So what you want to do is actually hit that button. Check this out. Now, check this out. Do watch. And then you don't do anything. The shot is not even on the button. You just step on it and step off. Piece of cake. That one's a red herring. That's how you get torched at the temple. Right? Okay, you walk your way out. You're What's done. That? Boom, shock locks. Don't get tricked. Next up, burial. Let's see. This one's relatively easy. You gotta wait for those triple shots. A one, a two, a three on the bottom. I'm feeling a little what? frisky, so I'm gonna go through the top here. Always go through the triple shot, though. That's the slowest one. There's another triple. We're gonna wait to see if this one double triples. Wait for the double. Move out. Okay, there we go. Now, pressure plate onto the walk here. Again, check for a triple. You should always have enough time after hitting that. It's a long shot. This is the triple long shot. It, it, the one of its kind. Take a picture. Send it to your goddamn grandkids. This is the triple long shot. No other ones do it. Only a burial at sea. We're really working overtime. This this breath of Rio is <sighs> breath of Rio, you know? That's it, though. <laughs> 
I'm not saying it was good, I'm saying it was unique. Alright, this one, you don't have to hit the button on the right. Most people do, and they think it's super hard. You just walk straight. Wait for the double. Well, scary. You just wait for the double. It will do it. While you're here, talk to your teammates. You know, get to know them. What, 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 who are you? How old are you? Where do you live? What's your address? Are your parents home right now? There you go. Perfect. Now, there's a plate here. Simply walk over that. Hit the button. You'll be safe as long as you tuck to the left. <gasps> And uh, here we go. Click on that chest. Not a lot here that can hurt you except for those buttons. Again, this is a trick button. Stand on it. It's going to fire. Then you stand off it. Here's two panels in the shooter. Move when it's firing the triple. That's how you do this one. This one's tricky. You want to move when it's firing the triple. Sometimes they don't fire triple. So you just move when it fires. Oh, double button. Double button. But we have another trick button here. Stand on it. Get off the butt. Are you catching on? Am I, am I fucking my getting through to you yet, out. please? Long shot here. Pass when it fought, when it passes you. And then you can tuck in over here. All right, watch for the triple. <gasps> Holy shit. That is, don't do that. That, I should not be alive right now. I just saw death. I just saw death. You know, I always, I always think that when I die, Nahaz is going to be waiting Ready. for me. I think Nahaz is still alive. But um, I'm sure he won't be by the time I'm dead. Alright, now this is a really tricky one. This chest is a real piece of shit. I wouldn't actually try this unless you have the shield or the puck upgrade. Uh, this one's tricky. There's no real way around it. It's just a really, really good dodge. So, you gotta hit it. Then you go back for the button. Then you gotta hit it again. Now, depending on where that item falls, it gets more and more dangerous to get. You say, I'm gonna leave that heart for some other fucking dumbass. I, no thanks. I ain't gonna lose a heart to gain a heart. That ain't good economies. All right, no gonna doubt. hit this button right here. NBD, that doesn't fire on you. You're fine. Watch out for the shooter. Stand in front of the button. Don't hit the button when you come in. A lot of people hit this button. There ain't no pinata coming out. There ain't no prize. The prize is death. Patience. Wait for it. Wait for the shot. You're gonna be fine. You don't. Now you do have to Boy. tuck right here. If you try to go the full way, if you try to run the entire way, you're gonna die. You do have to tuck. For God's sakes, tuck yourself. Get ready for the shot. You're gonna make it. Boop. Go, go, go. This is another one of the right, myself. left, right. You can just go right again. I like to go left. It makes me look cool, but it's fine. And then that core. Okay, crumbling colonnade. To battle. There's fire again. There's a button again. This is a trick button, by the way. You stand on this. It shoots the arrow. Just don't move. Wait for the triple. Yes. Triple, triple. We're good. Out we go. Stand on the button. We're good. Stand on the button to kill your teammate. We're good. Stand right here. Wait for the triple. Yes. We're fine. Is this a triple? We're fine. And we're moving on. Okay. This one is a little complicated. This one kills people. So again, this is one of those APM ones where you actually have to boop, 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 click your way through. You're going to hit this button. You're going to go to the right after the thing shoots and you're going to walk up it. If you simply just click, your character might go into a wacky place. Pass. And we don't, we don't have hijinks here on the crumbling colonnade. All right, it's not your crumbling colon from years of Mountain Dew exposure. It's the colonnade. So let's keep it together and uh, don't shit yourself as we continue through it. Watch for the triple. We're fine. All right, now we're going to go over here. We're going to tuck real tight. We're going to tuck real tight. We're going to walk in and then instantly go for that uphill after hitting that button. Piece of cake. This one's not dangerous at all. You hit this button, it kills your ally. Before you hit this button, say, bros, bros, I'm going to hit this button. I'm going to hit this button. Bros, like bros. Then you hit it. Fantastic. Okay, here we go. Double, triple. You guys know the drill this one. These, again, are random every single time. It's going to be random. Safest time to go is when they do that. The double, triple. That's what you're waiting for. You can sit there for like eight cycles or something. It's crazy. It actually takes a long time sometimes. Anyway, you're going to wait for both of these to go at the same time. Double, double. That means it's safe. There it is. Whip. On our way. There's a pressure plate at the top of this hill here. Be careful. Walk through. And here's one that looks scary. It's not scary at all. You just literally go left. Why do people die? I don't know. Ah, my favorite chest. Guys, welcome to the purge chest. And I've played this game mode with purge about 10 times. Every single time we come to a crumbling colonnade, he dies to this chest. It's affectionately called the purge purging chest. Uh, there's a shooter up there. It shoots. You have to look for it. He's just so taken aback by the chest. And then he goes... Hey, hello everybody, I'm gonna go get this chest. I died. I did not know that there was something like up there. Don't fire. be like Purge, guys. Uh, know that the shooter's up there. Get the chest. Don't let the greed blind you. 
All right. On it. Coming over here. Uh, we're going to wait for both these to fire at the same time. That's the safest time to move. And it, it could take a while. It takes some cycles. Like any Heat good wave. skill. It takes a while. 10,000 hours I've been in trap rooms. Aha! Big Martyr Zone. All right, this is where you should use your, your spell or whatever to get through this one. This one uh, really tricks people because they forget where the buttons are. Your safe spot, my friends, is uh, after Nita uh, in the north. It's on the north. Okay, I'm gonna hover over it right here. I'm gonna hover. Look at my thingy. Look at my thingy. Right? Right there. You see that candy cord? Mm, that looks sweet. Go right there. Don't go bottom. If you go to the south after the bottom, you're gonna get hit, okay? You gotta go north. Look at the candy corn and think about how sweet it is. Think about its salivation, its chalky taste in your mouth. That is the direction you gotta go. See, just like that. If you go south, you're gonna die. That's how everybody dies. This, after this, very easy. You just click on that one. This one shoots the one to your left. So you just stand on the button, wait for it to go, and you're out. That's it. Just go north. Remember, northern yes. candy corn. All right, say it out, scream it. When you get to that part, scream Northern Candy Corn to your teammates and keep repeating it. All right, here we go. This one's fucking annoying and I hate it. Welcome to the Mortal Manor. It's got a lot of invisible walls. It takes forever. If anyone's on your ass, if anyone's bumping up to you like a like you're at the club and some dude keeps bumping up on you, back the fuck up. That's the Mortal Manor, all right? That's where you're at right here. It's tight, it's awkward, it's terrible. Anyway, long shot here. Again, as always, no. you go after the long shot. Now, this part is horrific if someone's on your ass here. There's no escape. If someone's behind you, you're both going to die. So uh, you want to hit this button and go immediately left. Most people try to run north and stand in front of that breath of Rio up there. Just go left. Move. Don't even risk it. Don't even hit traveling. the button. I went north to show you what uh, you want to look cool, but I'm telling you, just go left. It's fine. It was anyway, make your way through. Boom shakalaka, you can stand in front of this, wait for a triple, make your way through, easy peasy. That's a trick button, stand on that, wait for it to shoot. Ah, avoid hitting that switch or you're gonna die, get the chest. Piece of cake. You don't have to hit the button again, there's a pressure plate, simply walk, your move speed will always get through. You trick pressure plate here, stand on it, there you go. Alright, this part that kills everybody. Uh, if you have an ability, this is one of two places to use it. Now these are double long shots, okay? It's not that big of a deal. The third one on the right, it doesn't really matter. You can make it through the double long shot, especially if you go behind it. Now you have plenty of time. All right, no double longer. long shot. Look how much time I I literally stop in there. Take, take a smell of the fresh air if you go behind that one. It's really no big deal. Okay, little bit of an invisible wall the there. So be careful walking, crossing that one. This one has a, a very sneaky tuck. All right, very sneaky tuck. That's how I sang so high in my high school choir. A very sneaky tuck. You can go on the left here. Check this out. Piece of cake. Look at this. It, it, it won't look like you attended. can make it, but you can. And now, you have all the time in the world. Take your time. Breathe in the roses. Call it. All right, pressure plate again. There's a chest. Don't click on the chest or the pressure plate will kill you. Now make your way out here. Uh, here we go. All right, this one, scary. Go around the right, hit the button, go around the right. Hands off the keyboard, you can go left if you feel really crazy. Boom, you're gonna make it with the movement speed. Now, here, I like to tuck left and then walk around it, but in this one, I think I might go right, just because I'm feeling a little sassy. All right, let's talk right here. So to the right, on this bush, there is an invisible wall. This invisible wall is broken and it kills more people than anything else. So be very, very careful. If you try to hug the hedge, you're going to die. All right. Now, you're going to wait for the fire and you're going to make your way through after that first one. That was, a, that was a crazy maneuver, so let's see that one more time. I have seen this one change a few times where it has different firing mechanisms. That's way too fast. Wow, I went way proceeds. too far back. All right, here we go. You can always go after the top launcher or you can bypass that invisible wall, hide behind the left Rio, and then just quickly tuck around. Uh, if you're feeling risky, you can go for the top. I personally like doing the quick tuck these days. The Check for the triple. Way. Here we go. Fantastic. All right. I, I don't know how you could possibly die to this one, but you literally just it walk to the left. Promised. That's it. Hit the button. Stand on the button. That's what kills people. This is a trick button. Again, you just stand on it. Then you go. And tra-da, mortal Hard banner. Enough. Takes a long time, goddamn annoying. If people are on your booty, you, you ain't gonna be dancing. 
Uh, but it gets done. The passage of penance! Penitent one! If you know that reference, please Could like, comment, otherwise. subscribe, and never watch my video again. Here you go. That's your first time ever getting to a pressure plate. The pressure plates are really stupid. It even if you stand promised. on them, they don't kill you even in Apex. It's pathetic. Wait for this one. When it shoots, move. That's your shot. Uh, sign to move. Path. When it's shooting, move. That's another trick button. We're going to click on that. Wait for the triple. Hit the cup. Boom. What are these Evil. stupid fucking things? Who built this? Who built this? Franklin? Some dude named Franklin? Could you put a trap in Wait Franklin? Absolutely. Session. There's your pressure plate, boss. Great. That's cool. Wait for the triples here. No, I mean, it doesn't no, even do anything. anything. You step over it and your spikes come out. It doesn't kill you. Who would fall for such a, an easy-to-see ruse, I ask you? Making our way down the bottom. Wait for the triple. Do Don't try I've to do both of them. This. I know you think you're a trap god now. This one's real easy. You ever, you ever walked to the left before? That's literally all you have to do. All right, now, this is a tricky little chest. Now the pressure plates, boom, they're gonna get you. They're gonna spike you. This is this is a Franklin's big fucking old magnum opus. All right, I'll show you how to get this chest. It's a dangerous one. That's it. You can click all the way to the left. All right, if you click on it, you're gonna hit, hit by the spikers. Very dangerous. All right, wait for the triple here, and you know Avoid you'll be able to take it. Ooh, seats. don't hit that button, dude. Scary stuff. One, we know it's a triple. One, two, three, I and then walk we're gonna walk over. The mortal way. All righty, upward pressure plate. Don't get caught there. People will laugh at you. They're all gonna laugh at you Other if you die to that one. Tuck in right here. Illusion. Wait for the triple. Two. Hit the uh, northern side. One, two, three. Make sure that we get Franklin Call fired by never even touching the plate, just for fun. Literally does nothing. His quota is down, Moving and now we have ended his life. Quota about to go back up, though. Uh, make sure you're not hit. Don't click the chest, guys. What does green mean? Green means stop. Hmm. If it's highlighting no. green over the chest, it will kill you, and then you simply make your way back. Those things will never Just kill you as long as you don't directly click on top of them. Okay, here's the part that's hard. Again, we got another button puzzle. Here is how you're going to want to do it. You're going to want to go to the left down here to make sure that you can make it past it this guy. So. Now we're in prime position, and then you're gonna go one, two, three. You're gonna hit all three buttons and go to the left. It's not even necessary to hit the buttons. I like to do it because I think it's flashy and cool. I feel like Hawkeye, my favorite Avenger. Disney, please don't DMCA the video. I'm just kidding, I don't watch that garbage as we continue through. Now, this is the scary one, guys, all right? This is the fastest boom, boom, pow you're ever gonna do. You gotta hit the front one, the second one, and then tuck in. All right, this is actual skill. The passage of penance is real skill. If you have any abilities, use them now. This one is scary. All right, that's the tuck, tuck, boom. There you go. Piece of cake. Okay, and that just about does it for the passage of penance, penitent one. Hope you make it up the, the ash pile. Coming up next, the tomb of terror. And let me tell you, this one is easy. The, the, what's terrible about it is how long it takes. Wait for the triples. Dead there you go. There's a fakey drifting. out button. Woo! It won't even kill your allies. Wait for this one. Is this one a triple? It sure is. After Quickly. that triple, we walk on through. Oh my god, the door, guys. <sighs> so scary. These doors do fucking nothing. I, I literally don't know why they exist. It, it literally exists just to be annoying. That's it. It will never kill you. So you simply walk over there. There's some buttons here. What a cool button. Wow. What a tricky puzzle. Um, anywho, long shot coming up here. That safe spot is on top of the candles. <laughs> Go on top of the candle. Light them up with your cursor, bro. All right. That's the part that's dangerous for many. Not for me, though. If you go left, you're going to die. There, That button right there, the left button, you're going to die. It looks like you should go left. But what you really want to do is go right. On the Tomb of Terror, you just remember that this tusk here holding the sword, he says, all good children go to the right. Truly. And that's what I whisper every time that I go by that tusk ta statue with the candles. I say in the chat, all good children go to the right. And uh, my teammates mute me, but they make it through the room. And that is what's most important. As now we're going to wait and see if this does a double shot. It does. And uh, we're going to wait right there. Perfect. You tuck in on the left after the double Quickly. shot. Perfect. Tuck it again. Use the candles. Candles mean safety in this game mode. All right. Yes. There's the door, guys. Holy shit. Is that a door? How are we going to bypass it? Oh, my God. A door. 
What? Here's what you do. You wait for the door to open, and then you go immediately after. Tuck to the right. Going. That's it. It's a goddamn door. Do you know I use a door? Fake button here. Stand on the candles. Candles mean safety in this room, guys. If you're ever having terror, light some candles, you know? Just kidding. Don't do that in real life. That's yes. what invites witches. Don't highlight the treasure. I almost did it. Never click on the treasure. If you have any candles in your house, throw them away. It's not 1920. Lighting candles is how you get witches. All right. Now, this is a, a scary part. You hit this button, then you have to run for it, right? Yeah, how are you possibly going to time this? How are you possibly going to make this? People panic when they see this. Don't panic. This is a trick button. You stand on it. Wait for it to shoot, and then guess what? It does nothing. You can just walk now. Don't panic. Wait for the long shot. Stand Agreed. off the button. Doesn't fire again. You've done it. Tomb of Terror. Piece of cake. Be careful for witches in real life. They're real. They are real. Mischief Mines! This one has a trick, and I like to say, Ooh, don't get caught to mischief! Anyway, uh, so uh, you're gonna walk by here. There's a there's a button there. Again, the button doesn't hurt you. It's a trick. That's not the mischief, though. Don't get, don't get twisted. Now, you think you want to go to the left, right? I'm just kidding. You want to go to the right. Uh, wait for this guy to shoot. There you go. That means you're safe. Walk forward. Piece of cake. All right, this one, the crack. For some reason, people don't think you can stand on the crack. It ain't gonna break your mama back. Step on that shit. Even if she, it does break your mother's back, she won't know it was you who did it. Stepping on that crack. All right, piece of cake. How is she possible? How, how is she gonna sue you for that? All right, you can walk behind the minecart here, or you can be a Chad and walk in front of it. I choose to walk in front of it because it limits the amount of times you have to go by the fire here. This one, not tricky at all. Wait. Can he wait for three? As Good, it doesn't do three. Let's go. Alright, hit this button here. It's not gonna kill you. Again, wrong kind of shot. Oh. <gasps> See? That's a little bit of mischief, but that's not the real mischief. Oh, fuck! Boom! Alright, 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 all right. I did not die. You can check the hearts right there, okay? I, I messed up the recording. Anyway, so here's the real mischief, okay? It's after this. This is walk over a button. Here's the real mischief, okay? This button right here. You click on the button, you think Sandy you want to get that chest. Cometh. There you go. That, that was it. That was the big trick. That was the mischief. Are you disappointed? I know I am. I'm very disappointed. Just kidding. Correct. That wasn't the mischief. The real mischief is coming. Trust me, guys. All right, you're going to hit this button. As I said before, click on the thing. Really? Put your hands up. You're going to make it. Okay. Now, this is difficult city. This is what kills everybody. This one's easy. It's your standard walk by, tucking on the right. You're going to be able to tuck in on the right again if you want. Or you can stand right below the button, which is fine. You can actually hit the button and move to the left. No problem. And here it is. This is mischief. This is the mischief mine right here. You look at that button and you say, if I hit that, I'm going to get hit by that thing in the north. No, dear friend. No. Look at that sneaky little, look at that sneaky little snake looking at your booty right there. He's like... He's eyeing out that dump truck, and he's like, what's in there, bro? Mind if I shove an arrow up in it? Don't let him do it, all right? This button shoots the snake behind you. This is the mischief of the mischief mines. So you gotta get this chest, and you gotta be ready to run away from that dump truck-looking, badonkadonk-loving mother sucker, all right? You're gonna wanna click that mine and move quick to the left. Quick to the left. I don't even think you have to hit the button. There it is! Ooh! Woo! Curl! That's Curl right there, the garbage man looking for the dump truck. Don't let him in there. And there you go. Fantastic. All right, shortcuts here, my friends. Shortcuts. This is your first time meeting with the slicey dicey decapitation boys. They're not as scary as everyone Never wants them out to be. As soon as you know the trick, they're fine. So we're going to wait for a triple. Do you triple? No, you don't. Hit the button. Hit the button. Be careful. Walk up that thing. Pressure plate. And these are easy. All right, let me explain these things. So a lot of people have questions about these. When you die to these, look for the sparks. You see that? You see that spark animation? That's the part that kills you. If you're not hit by that spark, you will not die. But the sparks come in a little bit after it goes. No. So it tricks people. The sides of these are very tricky. Uh, those things on the side, they sometimes will hit you and clip right through you. Other times they'll kill you. Uh, give them a lot of burp. All right, this part's easy. You want to tuck into the right. Hidden panel here, by the way. This gets a lot of people killed. They go right on top of this panel, and then they run back out. 
be careful. Stand on the panel to make sure that you're safe. Each Fire twice and go. There's a chest on the other side of this. All you have to do is wait for the triple. No triple. You're fine. Other options Moving right along. Go illusion. back. Don't hit any more buttons. Oh, look. It's Franklin Spike Traps. Great job. So... Does nothing as we walk over here. This part gets a lot of people killed. You simply want to do two things when you see these head splitters. Number one, check where the sparks are. Number two, walk during the apex. Now, what does that mean? That means that when it's swinging, whoop, whoop, it's much like a long shot. You wanna go after it goes by you. Or if it's a super long one, you wanna go right after it goes by you the opposite way. You know what I'm saying? Either wanna follow these guys after they pass you, or you want to follow these guys after they go past you. It's all about the apex of their shot. You see how it's right in front of me? I want to follow it. The way. There you go. Piece of cake, you'll make it every time. Uh, this one's a little tricky. You, I like to tuck it real close here path? and wait Where for the, a the secondary apex. You know, I followed it last time. This time I'm going to go the other direction. On its own, I, don't, I don't think I used the term apex correctly. I just know there's a game no about it. Hit. So, anywho, tuck in right here on the corner. This won't hit you. Got a lot of birth there on the corner. But it's all good. Don't walk too far. It was always that will so. kill some people once in a while. But as you can see, this thing passes right through me here. It doesn't actually kill you most of the time. Sometimes it does. I, I have no idea. Hey, give those things I've some birth. Hey, give them some birth, all right? You know that uh, when that weird person <laughs> asks you out to prom no. and you're like, oh, I guess I have no one else to go with, but... Should I actually do this? Don't. Give it some birth. Now, that's a little trick, by the way. If you have full hearts and you pick up a heart, you can actually go back and get it. They changed this. Before you could pick up a chest and then your allies could go back and pick up whatever in the, is in the chest. You actually can't do that anymore unless you have full hearts. You can pick up hearts and your allies can go back and get them. That is the only way they can go back and get them. However, big note here. Uh, the buttons that shoot the arrows, those still work. So it's super funny if somebody has to go back and get a heart and they have zero hearts and then you're like, oh, just go back and then they hit a button and then they die. That's the hardest I've ever laughed on this entire game mode. So Call make sure you do that permission. every single time. Trick those noobs that have zero hearts into going back and then take their heart for them and go, oh, sorry, bro. All right, Scars Hollow. This is pretty fun. I you stand here in between these two. The mortal way. Yeah, wait for this one. This one doesn't kill you. Don't be scared. It's just there to spook you. It is Scar's Hollow. You wait for the long shot. Walk after the long shot. How many times it do I have to say this promised. shit before you finally get it? How many times do I have to drill this shit in your head? Why won't you pay attention? It's a three hour long video and you won't pay attention. Here we go. You're going to walk over this plate here. Walk over that plate. Franklin gets fired yet again. Check for a triple. No. Here we go. Now, this one is a little dangerous. Again, this is one that changes every single time. I personally wait here until I see both of them shoot. I've I've sat here for a goddamn full minute before waiting for both of them to shoot. It does it. There Moving it is. But it is random. This one, this chest has a very big AOE. As you can see where my cursor is, it's still highlighted. You have to, oh, pixel perfect that shit. Get it behind the chest, and then you can pick it up. Not that the Franklin plates kill I've you anyway. This. Goddamn worthless. I don't understand what these buttons are for. Why would you just not... Why not just literally do that? Whatever, there's do your second chest. This path, get that heart. Does it choose Fantastico. Me? Maybe don't get it, you know? Be a piece of garbage. Just literally leave it there on the ground. Rot it. A lot of people would love that heart. Don't worry about it. All right, again, you want to follow these after they pass you. No Find your safe hidden. spot. Woo! That's your safe spot right here. In case you want to look for that bad boy. Got to wait for this to pass me, and the then I'm going to walk. Proceeds. All right, long shot right here. Same rule. After it passes, you walk. That's it. This one's a little dangerous because it's one of the only ones that doesn't actually have the arrows underneath it. I don't know why that makes a difference. Some people just miss it. And this one's a little dangerous too. Again, the sparks. It won't kill you there. That whole area is good to go. It's the sparks that murder you. But you can tuck in here. You're fine. You tuck in here. You're I fine. Tuck in again. Surprisingly, this part kills a lot of people. It's pretty hilarious. I'll be a little patient here. Now you gotta wait for both of the these to pass each course. other, just like that. And then you're fine. Everything's great. Good job. Okay. Bush blades. This is the last trap. 
this is the one that you're probably here for. Welcome to Bush Blaze. Hello, thanks for clicking on the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, uh, put in the chat banana. Everyone that types banana gets a free gets a free hat roll from the giveaway bot. Bush Blades, that's why you're here. This one's a this one's a B, but it's all about knowing the right spots, and we'll go through them nice and slow for you, okay? The first one, you just have to wait for these two to pass each other again. This is a risky time to go, but check that out. Little trick I wanted to show you. If you go on the left, bottom, and that's the trick in this room. If you go on the bottom, you're never going to die, okay? It's all about going on the bottom. You ever go to the top, you ever go north, you're done. Go south, baby. Go south. It's like my honeymoon. As we move forward here. All righty. Now, except for this one. You do want to go north on this one. This one. Whoa! That's your safe spot number one. Let's rewind that here for you. Safe spot number one. I'm going to highlight it. Go north and tuck in on this plant. Going. This little off-colored plant. That's the one. Not pinky. You want the one that's not pinky. That's safe spot number one, okay? Moving your way up. Pressure plates. There we go. Don't Dead click on the box. Wait for the drifting. apex of the swingy. Grab the box, get the hearts, fantastic. We're gonna wait, then we're gonna go after the A passes you. Yes. This is danger right here, but what did I tell you? If you stay south, you're gonna be fine. You can go whenever you want on this one, as long as it's south. You just have to really tuck in south. It won't hurt you. All right, this one's dangerous. Check where we click you. I like to come right there and then go in the center. Now there's an invisible wall around that southern torch. If you get too close to that wall, it will push you out and you will die. So you really have to tuck in the corner here. Don't get lazy. Big tuck. When you walk around this, you're going to see my character go around that invisible wall. And that's what gets a lot of people killed. But what I tell you about yes. this, go south. Every time, as far south as you can, and you're going to make it. Look at that. You're going to want to tuck behind this post. Won't hurt you as you prepare to go for this chest. Because I know you're a greedy little goober. You want that chest. There you go. That's another safe position. This one's a little scary. You click behind the chest. <gasps> you gotta be careful. That one will kill you if you're not careful. Don't forget, you can just go through the back. A lot of people go to the right here. Unnecessary. You go past the chest. You walk over here. All right. Now, there's several ways to do this one. I'm gonna show you all of them. This is not even necessary. You can click on the little pink flower from here. But I'm gonna show you all of them in case you get scared, okay? There's a tuck spot right here after the apex as always when it passes you you're good you can sit right here you're fine look at that then the easiest one though is tiny Ooh. pink flower you see that guy right there that third pink flower that's your safe spot tiny pink flower very beautiful all right now this one's a little complicated i wouldn't recommend doing this one but if you're really scared you can go right here that's a piece of cake you can see from the outcrop and these little bushes down here. Bottom right. Quickly. Right there. Little bushies, okay? Now you're safe. Now, this is where everyone dies. The most dangerous part, this guy, because it looks like the head slicer is going right down the middle. Not accurate. Head slicer is going on the top. So if you just stay on the bottom, you're going to be okay. All right? However, mm. on the swing back, it can kill you. So do tuck while it's in midair and then you're fine. after this it's a piece of cake this is where you know the people that are really impatient die because they're so relieved that they didn't die and no one's gonna laugh at them take your time do the same a thing drift. wait for it to pass Woo! that one doesn't even hit you if you go at the same time boom bush blades and that's it it's all the trap rooms baby i hope that helped uh tips by the way tips big sexy tips here let me refresh you guys on traps okay Number one, if you have an item like the precious egg, it does have a chance to proc. Number two, if you have a blink dagger on stuff like bush blades, you can skip all of bush blades. Go in first before you turn into a donkey, blink to the end. If you ever have a blink dagger early and you get in the trap room, always ask to go first and blink at the end. Number three, don't forget your abilities. Every time you walk into a trap room, ask your teammates, what do you guys have? Pudge's hook goes first because they can hook someone at the end. Other two guys, if that's hydrogen, uh, uh, the Omni Knight shield, the speed booster, the uh, puck thing, have them go in the middle, and then uh, Clockwork Hook goes last every time. H clockwork Hook, by the way, you can click, you can click the chest. You can click the chests. This is dangerous as chests are usually in very deadly places where if you're standing outside the chest, you're gonna die. But in some of them, you can skip the majority of the room. So. 
Anyway, guys, with that, remember, above all, even if you forget what trap to do, the number one thing that kills you in traps is not being patient. Calm down. Take a deep breath. Uh, think about all the ways that you've disappointed your family by becoming a Dota player and just slowly make your way through the traps. The more trap rooms you get in a run, the better the run is. 100% of the time, it is always worth doing them. And now you know how to do them absolutely perfectly. And there you have it, friends. Now you are as genius as I in Agnum's Labyrinth. I've taught you literally everything I know. That is literally it. Uh, by culmination, you are as wise as Agnum. I'll just about do it. Just wanted to thank everybody for coming in and watching the video. Thank you so much for all of the fans and viewers that helped me make it. Uh, big shout out to guys like Baby J, like Dancing Cat, uh, like QNHP and Gaijin, these guys that are watching the stream and helping me come up with these tips. Also, big shout out to those those psychopaths that are still giving to me on Patreon. Yeah, I, I know it's been like... 11 months, okay? I, I'm working on it, alright? Here we are, here we go. Hope this four-hour goddamn movie is good for you. Anywho, guys, thank you so much for watching till the end, if indeed you did. Uh, don't worry, we'll get more normal stream and Lordgasm stuff coming out now, and we will get this YouTube back in action. If you do want to help me out, though, if you found any of this useful, uh, throw me a subscribe. I, uh, listen, I'm not going to ask for that at the beginning of the video, for God's sakes. If you're still here, you're some kind of sick freak that actually might subscribe and comment so the algorithm stops boning me this entire time. So go ahead and do it. I, wh what does it cost you? Nothing. You click a button, you psychopath. You're still here. Obviously, you have nothing better to do with your life. By the way, if this video guide was a little bit too much for you, don't forget this entire thing is put together for esports.gg. The written guide, all of my notes, pictures, everything. If you don't like my annoying voice, head on over to esports.gg. The description link has it for you. Thank you guys so much for watching, and don't forget to watch the trap guide. Bye. All right, hello, welcome to the secret end of the video. That's right, it's like a three hour long video and I put a secret ending in it because I know no one watched the entire thing, so here we are. Now I know what you're thinking. He didn't actually do bush blades without dying. I, I saw I saw the profile, I saw the hearts. I that can do it without thought. dying, it was a joke. It was a dank joke, it was a may may. Not only am I gonna do it without dying, I'm gonna do it in fucking showcase mode, boys. Are y'all ready for this? That's how good I am, baby! Advanced users only! Advanced users only, okay? Don't mess around here, here we go! You're gonna wanna follow it. Boom! There were two secret endings. For real though, I'm gonna do it. Here we go. Gotta wait, gotta wait. Now this is really how I would recommend anybody do bush blades. I mean, it's it's the easiest way to see the sparks. All right, it's very easy to see the sparks this way. Right there, check it out. Commentary. You don't need commentary when you're on this good. When you're this good, you don't need 
to provide commentary. The action speaks for itself. It's the goddamn Arcasey stream right now. I'm not gonna say anything for 30 fucking minutes. You're just gonna watch the gameplay and you're gonna eat this shit up. You ready? gentlemen bush blades in the mode i told you that i would be fine and there you have it i am the master thanks for watching